would like to call to order the recessed meeting from Tuesday uh, for our budget workshop for the Cabarrus County Board of Commissioners, May 23rd, 2019. Welcome, everyone. It seems like we've been here every day this week, almost. But we are happy to have our first presentation tonight from Carolina Farm Stewardship. And we will depend on Aaron Newton to introduce his fellow presenters. Welcome. Thank you very much for having us this evening. So with me this evening is Karen McSwain, Farm Services Director for Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. And also we have Ms. Gina Moore, the Organic Research Coordinator, and Dylan Alexander, our new Lomax Farm Coordinator. So we're all here this evening, but Ms. McSwain is going to be presenting on our behalf. Thank you, and thank you for inviting us here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Elma C. Lomax Research and Education Farm, which is a program of Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. And for the benefit of folks in the room and people who may be watching at home that are not familiar with our organization, we are a member-based 501c3 nonprofit. We're based out of Pittsburgh, North Carolina, but we provide services and work with farmers and consumers and uh, collaborators in both North and South Carolina. CFSA's mission is to help people in the Carolinas grow and eat local organic food by advocating for fair farm and food policies, building systems organic family farms need to thrive, and by educating communities about local organic farming. Our vision is to create a regional food system that is good for consumers, good for farmers and farm workers, and good for the land. We offer a number of different programs. Um, farm Services is the program that I direct, and through that program we provide technical assistance to farmers on a wide range of topics including conservation planning, organic certification, food safety regulations and certification, high tunnel production and farm business development. We also host a number of educational events. We have one of the largest sustainable agricultural conference in the southeast. We also host um, um, uh, farm tours, sorry, and we also host a smaller organic commodities conference. So as I mentioned, LOMAX is a program of Carolina Farm Stewardship Association, and the mission of LOMAX is to support local organic farming while encouraging a new generation of farmers. And we do this through four primary areas. One is our farm business incubation program. And for those of you that are familiar with LOMAX, this is the, what we refer to as the FIT program, Farmer in Training, that, um, the program that has been going on at LOMAX for over 10 years. We also have a program that we call SOILS, and that's Students Outside Immersive Learning at LOMAX. We also conduct on-farm research and, uh, and, and do a lot of community engagement. So I just want to talk a little bit about program numbers from last year. So this is what we did in 2018. We had five farmers in training that had land leases out at Lomax that were launching farm businesses or maintaining farm businesses. And we also provided land, infrastructure, technical assistance to four other um, local farmers. Uh, some of these were FIT graduates, and we also provided assistance to the YMCA's program, their Harvest Community Farm. We provided assistance to them. So our soils program um, is really the umbrella that we're using to talk about any kind of educational activity that we are conducting out at Lomax. And one of the biggest programs that we launched last year was with um, the school system, the Cabarrus County School System, where we hosted 556 graders out at the farm for half day or, field, or full day field trips. Aaron is passing out a little promotional piece. I apologize that it didn't make it into um, our materials prior to this meeting, but it is hot off the press and we just got it this week. 
Um, so we did that last year and we actually did it again this year back in April and one of the really neat things that we were able to add to this year's program was bringing in high school students from Cabarrus County through the FFA program and some horticulture and engineering students that actually helped staff the different stations that the sixth graders were stopping off at. So high school students were helping provide the educational um, components during those field trips, which was exciting and successful and something that we hope to continue. Some of the other educational programs that we offered at um, Lomax last year, we conducted seven standalone workshops on various topics around agriculture for 175 program participants. We worked with uh, Rowan Cabarrus Community College and um, conducted classes as part of their Agripreneur Academy and Network to 54 participants. We provided access to land, infrastructure, equipment to eight program participants. And another neat thing that we did last year was we started a relationship with Davidson College where we were hosting interns out at the farm. So that was very successful last year and we have another Davidson College intern that will be starting with us um, within the next few weeks. We also continue to do on-farm research and so we, last year we finished up a research project looking at growing heirloom tomatoes in high tunnels. Uh, we continued, uh, started a new project last year that we're continuing this year, which is evaluating the efficacy of biopesticides. And we recently received funding to look at evaluating scale appropriate no-till equipment. So those are the on-farm research activities that are happening at Lomax in which we hope to continue to grow. Tell what the, the Explain that a little bit to, to non-farmers. Sure. Like but all the all of them are... Appropriate no-till equipment. Sure. That so, sounds interesting. Yeah. So no-till is an agricult sustainable agricultural product production system that is designed to minimize impact on the soil. So a lot of agriculture, um, when you're preparing the soil for planting and you're doing mechanical weed control, really disturbs the soil. It tills it up. It breaks it up. It flips it over. And that's fairly detrimental to the microbiotic life that lives in the soil. And so um, a lot of conservationists, uh, sustainable agriculturalists um, have, uh, are promoting a no-till system in which you do not go through and turn around the soil and tear it up. You plant cover crops. And then traditionally, you come through with a tractor-mounted piece of equipment that's called a roller crimper, which kills the cover crops. Um, unfortunately, that method requires a tractor and a fairly expensive large piece of equipment. And so what we're looking at is can you get the same, you know, kind of effect with a walk-behind tractor or even a handheld crimping, you know, handheld crimping device so that we can determine if it is effective for farmers of all sizes, not just a 100, 200 acre farm, but can somebody that's just doing an acre use this no-till practice to, to conserve soil. I actually tested out the handheld no-till piece of equipment in my garden a couple weekends ago. <laughs> Community engagement is an area that Lomax um, does a lot of um, events around community engagement. And so in 2018, we hosted 350 visitors coming from different organizations um, in, in the county and across the state, the Great Outdoors University. A lot of schools come out there. So the Cannon School was out there in addition to um, public school students through our soils program, Leadership Cabarrus. Um, so a number of different community invent, events to engage the larger community. So that's what we did in 2018. Um, around programs and community engagement. We've also been working um, over the past few years to increase the infrastructure that's available at Lomax Farm. Um, a couple of years ago, we got a uh, cost share from NRCS and, and put up a new high tunnel. Um, Aaron largely has been working with um, county staff looking at expanding the utilities that are going out to, to the farm. Two new things, though, that we did in 2018 was we received funding from the Cannon Foundation to develop, um, to do infra infrastructure <coughs> development and design. And I, I understand that those pictures down there are fairly small, but we were able to hire uh, Little Consulting and Kimley Horn to help us develop a building space 
a structure that would meet our current programmatic needs as well as other community members programmatic needs and then we worked with little to do some site development and so we just received those final documents from them about a week ago and we'll be reviewing those documents um, and hopefully sharing them with county staff at a later date we also got funding from the Carolina Farm Credit to replace the irrigation system. Um, there was a lot of, uh, I like to refer to as irritation with irrigation, but there was a lot of system, a lot of problems with the, the system that was in there. And so we got some funding to replace the entire irrigation system on the farm. We also had some great publicity in 2018. We were very excited to um, have an article in um, our state magazine. I say 2018, that was the one that came out this May. So we had a piece in our state magazine. Uh, we were also promoted on Morning Ag Clips, which is um, kind of a newsletter that goes out in North and South Carolina promoting different agricultural events and stores and um, things like that. And so we were highlighted in that. And we were also highlighted in Oregon Tilth, or in Tilth, which is a publication put on by Oregon Tilth, which is one of the larger organic certifying agencies in the country. And they highlighted Lomax and specifically um, our interns and mentorship program that happens there. And so that went out to people across the country. So uh, now to talk a little bit about budget um, and why we're here. Um, I wanted to start out and share with you all what the overall LOMAX budget is and so what, what the expense is to Carolina Farm Stewardship Association for running the LOMAX program. And some of these I'm going to get into the first two, land management and community engagement, I'm going to break down into a little bit more detail because those are the two areas that we've specifically asked for support from the county. And those are two areas that we have found very challenging to get support from either federal or state funders and foundations and individual donors. Um, but just want to point out land management for Lomax um, costs CFSA about $78,000 a year. Community engagement, $20,000 a year. The programs that we offer, $35,000 a year. The research component, $35,000 a year. Fundraising, $40,000 a year. And that includes both um, grant writing for federal and state grant opportunities, submitting um, applications for fundraising events, and also uh, kind of some traditional fundraising with corporate sponsors, individual donors. And then general admin cost in terms of um, you know, administration time spent with Lomax. And so really the total cost to CFSA to run the Lomax program is a little over uh, $223,000. And just to break down a little bit more the two components that we're specifically asking the county to help us support, the biggest one is land management. And staff time, it uh, costs CFSA about $55,000 a year, and that's to maintain the 30-acre piece of property, the structures, the equipment, um, the irrigation system, everything on that property. Um, and then there's equipment and supplies cost that also includes maintenance of equipment, replacing equipment, servicing equipment, cost CFSA about $13,400 a year. And then rent and utilities and insurance is another $10,000 a year. And as I mentioned, those are areas that are extremely challenging for CFSA as a nonprofit to get other entities to help fund. And then our community engagement piece, we have had some success getting foundations to support that. Um, and it's kind of a, uh, it's fantastic the amount of engagement that we are getting from the community and people that want to come out to the farm and do different things at the farm. And unfortunately, we're at a point right now where the demand from the community is exceeding what we have successfully been able to get from foundations and individual donors and sponsors. So those are the two areas that we're asking county support for. Um, and here's just a line item budget to compare in terms of the cost to CFSA and the support that we're asking um, the counties. And as you can see, the land management piece we're really asking for um, 
most of the support coming from the county to manage the land and then a little bit of support for us to be able to really meet the need of the community engagement activities and then programs and research those are two areas that we have been fairly successful at getting federal grants um, and foundations to support um, and then the fundraising and administration costs are um, you know CFSA is covering those through our other budgets Um, so in closing, just want to um, uh, share contact information, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, this will be the last meeting that Aaron will be attending as a CFSA staff member, although I suspect we'll try and drag him back here in future years. Um, so wanted to share just some contact information with everybody. Um, we, we do have a new Lomax Farm coordinator, Dylan. Um, myself as the Farm Services Director and our Operations Director. Thank you. Questions? Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Um, what about fundraising? Can you give us some information about, you know, how much and who and all of that kind of thing? Sure. So our fundraising comes from a number of, number of different places. Um, so we do, depending on what component of Lomax. And so I do a lot of grant writing, which funds our research component and it funds some of our educational component. So the research that we've been working on right now, that funding has largely been coming from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture through a USDA specialty crop block grant. Um, we've just submitted a number of proposals to other government um, uh, grant funding sources. So that's the grant funding side. Um, in terms of other f um, fundraising efforts that we've done, we submit proposals um, every year to foundations such as Wells Fargo, um, Cliff Bar, uh, a, a, a foundation that's called UNFI, which is a produce distributor. Um, we're constantly trying to build relationships with other local foundations, and so we've been trying to build relationships with the Jimmy Johnson Foundation, um, some of the um, hospitals in Cabarrus County, and then individuals. We are trying to um, get funding from individuals. So right now we're in the middle of a Lomax donor campaign where we have sent out um, letters at least once to initially all previous individual donors, sponsors of Lomax, and we do um, email, continue that with email reminders. That's brought in close to $2,000 at this point. Um, the foundation funding that we've received, Wells Fargo has typically been giving us about five to $10,000 a year. UNFI gave us $10,000 last year. Um, we are working with some um, local, uh, other local businesses that are donating to us, Southern Grace Distillery. Um, they have been very generous sponsoring us um, through sales of their products. Um, we have a fundraising committee and we meet every two weeks. We have a fundraising plan specifically for Lomax, which identifies our fundraising, fundraising goals and we're constantly trying to add um, you know, and identify new corporate sponsors to be asking for funding for. Um, that is a relatively new um, funding um, avenue for myself. We do have um, development staff that, that have um, <coughs> that kind of experience. And what I'm finding even with these, with foundations, their funding, they want it to specifically go to programs, educational programs, workforce development, or community outreach and so we've been relying on those foundation funding to fund our community outreach um, but again it's very difficult to get some of just um, the general operating expenses from those foundations and corporate sponsors I don't recall if it was last year or the year before Aaron you may remember whenever <coughs> we were trying to um, to come up with a you were asking for 40,000 and then supposedly, if my memory serves me correct, we were supposed to go the opposite way with it for five years, 40000 and then we dropped to thirty, and so and so and so. It might have been a $5,000 decrease each year. And we were hoping that uh, we could do that with um, you, your fundraising 
would be considerably more by say, the county saying, well, we're going to do this for five years, which give you some stability for that income. But um, I can't speak for the rest of you guys, you know, I mean, only for myself. But, you know, it's a wonderful program. You've, you've had five graduates this year, I believe I've seen five farmers this year. And then you've had the programs for Rowan and for the county school system. But when you ask for $80,000, that's when my eyes sort of open up a little bit more because it's going the wrong way, in my opinion. But, um, but it's a wonderful program that goes on out there. I know, Blake, you've been, and I imagine Steve's probably been. Everybody's mm -hmm. pretty much been out there except me. I hadn't been out there yet because it seemed like for whatever reason something comes up. You're welcome anytime. Oh, I know, yeah. <laughs> Just bring my hoe and some old boots and something, you know, you can help work. But, um, you know, I, I, my comment is, is that I was really wanting to see the fundraising. The word that University of North Carolina was supposed to be involved, what I understood from a couple of years ago. And um, has anything developed on that? Um, so I can I can speak to to um, your your concern and question about how you know we had thought that our ask for funding would be going down and 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 that fundraising that decreasing fundraising plan um, was talked about in I believe it was 2016 that we came up with with that plan and at that point CFSA had only really been um, conducting doing fundraising efforts and. Um, kind of managing the Lomax farm program, I would say maybe for about a year and a half at that point. Um, and we did not know how challenging it would be to get the funding to, to manage the physical space. And so we have been very successful at increasing the funding to, to do programs, not all of them, but the ones that we are managing. Um, we have been successful to, to get funding to do programs particularly the research that we're doing that's been very successful and that's that's growing we will um, within the next six weeks we will have submitted four proposals to do research at Lomax and those proposals would be over a million dollars worth of research now those all four are not going to get funded but the research component is one of the strongest er areas that we feel that we can grow but again, it's very challenging to get somebody else to pay for the land management, and we just we have not been able to to accomplish that. Um, so I don't I don't see us being able to to get funding to do the basic land management of the county property and the equipment that's on it. Okay, Th this question uh, for the county manager: the property itself. It was donated to the county, I believe. Can you clarify all of that for us? What the, uh, what the arrangements are? Yeah, what? Jonathan may have to help me. It was donated by Miss Lomax uh, several years back for the use of a park, for the, for a park, and all during that time we had no use for a park in that general area there, and that's when we were approached by Aaron to, to and talked about the farm, and we looked at the farm park comp. Um, idea and and whereas it could be an operating farm but we would also bring in people to come out to could walk and look and watch the farm going on how it operates but then also go to some of their their uh, their their programs out there as well so it, it currently meets the I guess the the definition or or the meaning of what what it's supposed to be used for uh, I mean we don't have playgrounds or anything else like that out there but it's a different kind of park uh, that we think uh, is good it's still it's in its natural state and it's a uh, open space and it's open space that's under production of, of crops and so it is working well um, one thing before you get as you continue to discuss we we are no this we are proposing to pull this out of the general fund budget if you so choose to fund it then the funding would come from the present value uh, money that you have in, in that fund there that is is every and again present value means every time that a farm is turned into something besides a farm then those back taxes have to be paid to the county so we're moving those monies into a fund to hold for agricultural uses in the future so or, or parkland or sure. open space what if what if 
the farm wasn't there, what would happen to the property? If the farm wasn't there, the, at this particular time, the county has no use for the property. Okay. So we would either hold it until there was a use for a park, or the other option would be give it back to the Lomax family. Um, so what, pay, where in the book is, is the, when you're, I guess I was trying to figure out the number or what we were doing. So where would that be in the book? It, it's, um, I'm not sure it's in there since it's not coming from uh, 367. Oh, I lost my pencil. Well, I'll have to remember. 367. Okay. 367. Well, I, I just wanted to be able to read that. Let me so, make sure. Um, so I, a couple quick questions. Um, did not realize you were going to do something else. I, I will say that in the, the, the maybe the most fun day that I've had in an official capacity as a commissioner would be the day I spent <laughs> at the farm. So nice. I, I just... I had a blast. It was it was fun. Um, very interesting to walk around and see. Lynn, Commissioner Shu just mentioned that he would bring a hoe when he comes out. It, it's not a bad idea. It's hard to watch people work without wanting to jump in and, and, and help. So uh, it just, uh, I don't know, something very cleansing about with the soul being out and watching people work the dirt was, uh, I enjoyed that day very much. So. Um, you mentioned that you then so there was a 10-year window of, of something. Dude. So, in in the, but this hasn't been going. We haven't been out there doing the fit program for 10 years. This we? is this is our 10th year anniversary. Okay. So and, for the and first, so how many graduates do we have in the 10 years? Last year was five. But what's the total number? I would have to go back and look at the numbers, and we would have to. I would want to share the stories of what we're saying, who's graduated, and what they're doing now. But, um, you know, north of 40 people have come through yeah. that program and have gone on to do something else that's been based on their time at Lomax Farm. Okay. Well, so this is our 10th year anniversary, and the history is that the farm was started in 2009 by, by the county and with a lot of help from Cooperative Extension, and then transitioned to Carolina Farm Stewardship Association towards the end of 2014. So we're coming up on five years of having, um, of having operated the farm. Okay. Gotcha. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? I think y'all do an excellent job. Your, your outreach with the school system is phenomenal. Um, you left off one little group that I happen to know that came out there in a busload in a lot of mud and snow still on the ground, but that's okay. Um, but you do it. Y'all do an excellent job. I think it's a uh, an asset to the county to have. I don't think it's a matter of saying. I mean, I think it's great that you have five graduates, um, but if we um, we don't support farming then I think we everybody in this country is going to be in a lot of trouble um, we we can't guarantee uh, crops and food products that are coming uh, from other countries that um, it's what we should really be having here and there are a lot of um, security issues behind some of that and even a small effort like Lomax makes a big difference for the people that have been involved um, Mike, I think your suggestion, or whoever had the suggestion of uh, where that funding would come from, was um, it, it was very intelligent. So whichever of you in the room came up with that suggestion, I think it's great for it to come out of those those funds because they can only be used for certain things. So it makes perfect sense to um, transition from general fund and um, use those reclaimed dollars, or uh, the the term for it, and um, eighty thousand dollars in a. Two hundred and fifty-five million dollar budget is not much. So I think, and I think everything that you had to do out there is great. I can't imagine going out there and you not being there, but that's a completely <laughs> different issue. I know where you live, so um, and I follow you on Facebook. I don't know where you were last week, but you were somewhere fun. I could tell that much. So um, I think, and it's brought lots of uh, 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 publicity for Cabarrus County through um, a lot of different. Um, publications uh, the Avits have been extremely supportive and gotten us a lot of publicity uh, we had um, uh, Vivian here at the farm and uh, kicked off uh, one of her seasons in Kannapolis and just a lot of things that, that I think that in addition that you can't put a number on so I think y'all do great and I support your the recommendation in the budget to 
fund the eighty thousand dollars into and where the money's going to come from. So, Thank you. But I've always, you know, I've <laughs> been a supporter of your program since it started. Thank you, and thank you for your support. And I want to, um, if I may, either the second or third year into the program, I sat right where I'm sitting now, and you uh, reasonably challenged us, saying uh, the number of people that were able to use the farm only as our farm incubators, but only as farmers in training, meant that a very disproportionately small amount of the population could enjoy the farm. And I took that challenge seriously, and that's been part of why we've developed the program that's allowed us to offer the education, uh, access to research, and all of these other programs. So that came out of, I can directly remember you, you making that challenge to us. And we have had great success, as Karen has mentioned, being able to have others come along with us on that journey. It's been the, how do you keep the place mowed? How do you keep things fixed? How do you keep the place staffed? That's really been what's been most challenging. But, but that aside, I, I appreciate those words, and I hope to see you out there again. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Uh, certain, certainly glad to, to hear the number. I just quickly did math, which is not necessarily correct, but looks like about between 11 and 1,200 people that you've listed here that have been out to the farm this year. How, how does that stack up with previous years? To me, it feels like a pretty substantial increase. Is that? It, 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 is a, it is a substantial increase from 2018 to 2017, but the number that you just added up there is not the total number of people that come out to the farm. Mm -hmm. That's the total number of people that come out kind of connected to some of our programs and some mm -hmm. of our bigger, bigger things. Um, but we actually have probably closer to 5,000 people coming out to the farm every year um, through, di through different programs. We have a car counter mm -hmm. out there that counts about 6,000 people a year, but given staff and CFSA people coming and going, I, I would subtract 1,000. So we probably have about 5,000 people coming out there um, every year, which, which is substantially higher um, than it has been in previous years. Let me give you two examples that, that won't show up because they take just a bit of a narrative to explain, but I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, we had a beekeeper join us at the farm. Um, he, uh, an older gentleman, fell 30 feet out of a tree, broke his back, his neck, his collarbone, had to give up all of his, his hives to one of his, uh, one of the younger people he was mentoring who has now moved those bees to the farm and is using Lomax as a place where he can keep those bees was out at the farm the first day. We had sixth graders out here impromptu and was joined, was part of the program that day just because he happened to be at the farm. Um, so much so was this enjoyed. We just came from Central Cabarrus High School to this meeting and they said we have to make sure that the beekeeper is back next year formally as part of the program. So here's this synergy, this thing that happened where an accident led to someone needing us to have a place to keep these bees and then him being on the farm and these kids got an education opportunity the teachers saw how excited the kids were about this and said well next year we have to formalize and make sure he's out there every day and that's the kind of synergy that happens when you take care of a place that teaches people about agriculture the second was a gentleman who came to our monthly meeting that we hold every third thursday he just showed up last thursday and said he wants to to get more involved. He's already given Dylan a call saying, hey, when I can I come and volunteer and learn more about how I might engage in agriculture? And if there wasn't a place for him physically to show up to and meet us and shake our hands and learn more about what we're doing and come back and volunteer and maybe get involved, that's why the place itself is so special because it gives all of us within the community a place to show up to support agriculture. But it's hard to, those stories are hard to capture in numbers or in, in dollars or, or, or in a particular presentation, but they, I can tell you they happen almost every week and 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 those stories that you just told and your comments greatly contribute to the point that I was trying to make that that there are more you know the the number sometimes when we talk about the the farmers in training that sounds like such a small a small number that's just a, a piece of the of the overall picture and I agree with Commissioner Poole uh, I think the the funding coming from that present value fund that's designated for those purposes I think that is an ideal use of that that's the intention of it is to preserve <clears throat> farmland open land agricultural land um, I think in our community survey last year uh, preserving uh, open space was one of the very high priorities 
for citizens in Cabarrus County. I think this helps contribute to that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I applaud the work that you've done. And, and also, as was mentioned <clears throat> before, I think Cabarrus County gets a tremendous amount of positive um, public relations through the activities of the farms. You would, I have been surprised at people across the state who I have on occasion mentioned, well, let me tell you about the farm in Cabarrus County, and they have replied, oh, I already know about it. You know, so, so it, it does make a difference. Uh, so, so thank you for what you're, what you're doing. And, um, thank you. I was just gonna add one thing. I, I did ask them to, to have some of their partners that visit the farm, use the farm, have learned from the farm to show their support, and they, they provided that in your packet, and I know they're not gonna go through each of those letters, but I do wanna make sure you, you notice those are in there and take a look at those. Um, and I, I think, and I just glanced over those quickly um, during the presentation, but, and I think that those letters include some of the folks that are dealing with food insecurity in, in the county, which is, which is a, a priority issue for a lot of folks. So, I mean, to, to really comprehensively um, gauge the, the impact in all these different areas, it's, it's hard to put down on a piece of paper. Uh, and uh, certainly understand that, but you know, hopefully some of the things that we talk about and say here will will cause the general public to ask more questions if they're watching this on television or watching it on YouTube. Um, and, and I think that that gets us that that's another advantage having this conversation and people being aware of it. Uh, so, and they're welcome to contact us for more information. We have our fourth annual field day next Tuesday from 8.30 until noon, um, where we'll be sharing information in real time about the research that goes on at the farm, just one of the opportunities. So they can register for that at our website and come and join us, or they're always welcome to call and we can share more information directly. Excellent, thank you. So the, the funding that's been proposed is not actually in our general fund budget. Will that's that correct. be? That's correct. What's our? It would, it would come from the for the present value fund. It's a separate fund. And so that would be something that we would vote on separately outside of the budget. Um, um, how, how, what's the logistics on that? Yeah, there would need to be, Pam help me here, that there would probably need to be a budget amendment to move it out of that fund directly. Hold on one second, because it's, it was part of yesterday's I mean, the commissioners right. have not expressed their Yesterday's wishes at this point. I'm just asking what the, the procedural yeah. It's it's <clears throat> it's it's not difficult. It's just a matter of accounting and moving the money and, and, and documenting uh -huh. and moving the money. Uh, this present value fund has has accrued quite a, quite a bit of cash. So yeah, it's uh, got its own separate fund. So there yeah. was there was like a one spread. Do you remember what slide it was? It, it had was, a slide to use. Yeah, for. it was just showing backing the forty thousand out of the general fund. Right. Yeah. Now that's we, on. We, that's we, on. We were proposing all funding come from that deferred tax multi-year right. fund. Yeah, we had one that highlighted all the projects. Okay, it was on page 12 of uh, yesterday's book, and it's the bottom slide. It says Deferred Tax Collection it, Proposal. Oh, I didn't bring that. So it's yesterday's book, page 12. Uh -huh. yeah. And there was one, two, three, somewhere. four different projects that were proposed. <clears throat> and then Susan told you uh, how much money was in that fund that was available, and that was uh, uh, some options to utilize those funds for. Right. I don't think she spent maybe half of maybe half of the money. Yeah. yeah. She's, she's going to come up here and help you That's out. Yeah. So <laughs> in, instead, of, you know, we've worked with soil and water to buy some conservation easements out of there as well. Uh, we're being a little more creative because we have other other needs as well. Then those are some of the samples or examples on page 12 in yesterday's book, and I can read them out again. The Carolina Farm Steward, the uh, some of the improvements at the um, Camp Spencer Park. Uh, a, a new water line in Frank List Park and um, the purchase of, of parkland in the east northeast part of the county which around Mount Pleasant area so and I think for the benefit of the public watching that that fund the money that's in that fund represents agriculture agricultural property that we've lost in Cabarrus County to residential development and other purposes. So that's, 
that's where that money comes from. So, are there other questions? I would just say, since uh, again, um, I think that we should go forward with uh, see all of those recommendations that you have on page 12. However, the budget amendments need to be done to um, go forward, give them some stability on that, and um, I think it's a, when you point out that slide to do some land banking. We talk about land banking all the time to be able to to use some of those funds to try to find some property for a park over in that part of the county and we've talked about that for years all very good and logical uses of those funds so, Ms. so I think it's great Miss Barrington could do a budget revision and a project ordinance that would require a project ordinance also I'm getting better at this to uh, prepare that for uh, the work session if that's what the board chooses okay. thank you very much we thank appreciate you, you being with us today much. Okay, next we have several representatives from Rowan Cabarrus Community College for a presentation of their budget requests. Welcome. I think they have an event scheduled immediately after this, so I told them we would try to stretch it out as long as possible. Since we have to stay, they, they would have to stay with us, but just kidding. Just kidding. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, we're thrilled to be here, and we're not in that big a hurry to go and do some fundraising for our motorsports program at the Speedway, but we're, that's our next destination. Um, so I want to thank you for your time. I want to introduce Jonathan Chamberlain, our Chief of, of College Environment, and Carol Lewis, it's who's sitting sure behind work. us, as our Interim Chief Financial Officer. Um, let's see. I've got the clicker, huh? Okay. All right, so this is the same mission and the same mission we've had for a number of years now. It still suits us very well that we improve lives and build community through public higher education and workforce development. We're gonna give you a few highlights of this last year um, and then go through our request for this year. Um, and you'll see some uh, thank yous, appropriately so, um, with the Advanced Technology Center and some other kinds of things that I think you'll be pleased to hear about. Um, our vision, of course, is building sustainable futures through the power of learning, and we're talking about pe careers now as opposed to just jobs. So um, that's what we really pay attention to. Our strategic plan themes, uh, we've, we've got our strategic plan, but we just wanted you to see uh, the highlights of that, which is we're really interested in increasing the community's educational attainment. And this whole exercise is on how to answer the question about how can Rowan Cabarrus Community College increase the community's educational attainment that leads individuals, their families, and the region to prosperity, sustainability, and success. And so this is one of our key objectives. It's not just numbers of graduates, but it is, in fact, changing the educational attainment for the community. By doing that, the prosperity comes. And so um, actually Cabarrus is in a great shape for this, and we can only just add to its success. The other question we have is how to best prepare students to be responsible and productive citizens, which is how we uh, spend all of our time. And then how can we serve the community of the future? We're looking now at innovation. Uh, you'll see the Advanced Technology Center as one of the major thrusts for how to prepare for the future. And then lastly, we want to be a catalyst for change. And that is changing the, the expectations about education and realizing that most jobs in the future, 60% of them, will require some post-secondary education. And Cabarrus County's not there yet, um, but they're well on their way, or we're well on our way, and so that's a, that's a piece we'll come back to in a minute. Um, so one of the things that we're surprised about, actually, is this number, $335 million that is added income to the local economy every year with the incremental improvement of our salaries for our alums. So because they have gone to school and gotten a higher level credential or diploma, we are adding another 335 million annually to the local economy. So this is a great investment. The whole college budget's only 39 million, so you can see how the impact of this over 53 years, 56 years, um, has, has really made to the local economy. This is an updated number. Uh, the last time we showed it to you was probably four years ago when it was 263 million. 
part of that's because we have more graduates and part of that's because they're making more money. So um, we're very excited about this number. We see uh, education as an investment, not just for the individual concern, but also for the community. So for an individual student, it's about a six to one return on your investment. Some people don't think that education is worth it, but uh, a community college education level certainly is worth it. So it's a six to one return. So we are very much uh, pro proposing that um, students be aware of that so that they know that education is a way, is a great way uh, to make more money and to be more prosperous. So this keeps changing too. Our credit student on duplicated headcount by county continues to grow in terms of proportion for uh, Cabarrus County. It just went somewhere. Um, so it used to be that Rowan County had the bulk of our students, but now it's Cabarrus County. And so that continues to grow. Um, and we're gonna show you some more highlights of that because the college as a whole has grown 7% this year. And that's unusual. Most, most community colleges in times of full employment, which is where we are, we don't grow. Because people who can work will work and people who can't work will go to school and get ready for the next opportunity to work. So uh, that's what's happening with us is we are actually growing anyway. Our online program is growing uh, larger than any other growth area uh, and that's an important thing to say. So here's some of these other great things to, to talk about is that on Friday we graduated 1,743 students and 819 of them are graduates from Cabarrus County. So uh, you can see how we are rolling up more alumni and more students with uh, degrees, diplomas, and certificates that can earn them a living going forward. So of these 1,743 people, they earned a, a total of 2,500 certificates, diplomas, and degrees. So some of them have multiple degrees, some of them have multiple diplomas. And so uh, that's really helping us uh, increase their, their job availability and their job skills. So anyway, it was a very exciting day. We had to actually have two ceremonies because we outgrew uh, the ability for the arena to serve our students. The students wanted to bring more of their family and friends to this graduation, and we wanted them to, and so we had two ceremonies. And I wanna thank uh, Steve in particular uh, for being there and um, <coughs> working that whole day with us and seeing how the students crossed the stage and how proud they were and how proud we were of them. So we're very excited. This is the largest graduating class we have ever had. And so we're, we're excited about it and wanted to share it with you. This is another amazing thing, I think, is that tuition-free courses for high school students is another way of saying dual enrollment, career and college promise, all these kinds of things. This thing has a life of its own. Um, and so this is a, I think, a real tribute to the, uh, the resourcefulness of students and the great partnership that we have with Cabarrus County Schools and Kannapolis City Schools. And you can see, comparing the 2017-18 to the 2018-19 academic year, we have had a 46% increase in the number of students who are taking college credit courses while they're still in high school. Uh, that tuition is waived, so there, it, that's why it says tuition-free courses. And so this is a, an amazing thing. Uh, it's a great opportunity for students to get a head start um, it's, we have the early, two early colleges, as you know. Those are already a head start for those students, but we have others that are in traditional high schools that are availing themselves of this, and we're very excited about that, too. So um, I wanna give a little highlight here for the Advanced Technology Center and talk about new and expanded programs. It's hard to have new and expanded programs uh, in North Carolina in particular because there's no, really, no real money to support it. But we wanna talk about the, the uh, programs that we have developed specifically with the Advanced Technology Center um, as the location for these. And the first one is a mechanical engineering technology, electrical engineering technology, industrial engineering technology. We have all of these uh, technology <coughs> programs and all of this engineering. So we also have a, a transferable engineering program, which is new for us. And the home of that is in the Advanced Technology Center. And that will transfer the University of North Carolina Charlotte. And then you'll go into the program of engineering as a junior. So we're very proud of that. 
This is also the location where we'll, we have our apprenticeship management area. Um, the North Carolina Manufacturing Institute, which I've talked to you about before, um, is also going to be located in the Advanced Technology Center. They now have 50 businesses that they work with. Those people are going to all be in and out of this Advanced Technology Center um, working with us on the, the needs that they have for, for job growth. Then a new program for us is going to be Plastic Injection Molding Program. And that is in here because when we did a survey of what do the most employers need, this is an area we don't have and they need. So we'll, you'll see it starting at the Advanced Technology Center, along with the Industrial Automation and Certified Automation Technician Program. Then you can see a bunch of other little, you know, smaller things, additive manufacturing, product design and modeling. You know, these are the kinds of things when you see, think about 3D printers and, um, the, and computerized um, uh, continuous process improvement and computerized uh, additive manufacturing, then um, they'll all be housed there. And so this is, this is to be a dynamic center, changing all the time, going with the technology and the, the businesses that are, that are located here or going to locate here. So at the, at the Cabarrus <coughs> Business and Technology Center, we've made some, um, some great strides there. One is the diesel program, which was funded by the Golden Leaf program, has opened. We have students in there. Um, the other piece of this is that this is the location we're going to move the motorsports program from south there at some point in time, and we're working on those plans. So, so those are things that are going well. Um, next year, the seniors will graduate from the early college from this location as well, and that's going very well. On the College Station, which is our cosmetology program, which I think you know, I think many of you have been in there, um, we're adding a paramedic program to that same location because we have the space, and this is going very well. Um, I think you know that the city of Kannapolis uh, was able to renovate, buy this location and renovate it for us, um, and we have about 300 students in this location. Uh, so it's, it's uh, probably one of the best locations for cosmetology and we're, our students are doing uh, very well. We have high school students from both Cabarrus and uh, Kannapolis as well as from Rowan County in this setting. Um, so that's a great CTE to talk the lingo to, to uh, Commissioner Poole on career and technical education. That's a great model for it. And it's, uh, that's going very well too. On the research campus, uh, we're proud to uh, tell you that we've increased our nursing program from 120 slots to 200 students. We know that there's a huge waiting list, we know that there's big demand, and so uh, we've put, put our resources into increasing this, and this is located at the research campus. Dr. Spalding. Yes, ma'am. Is there any limitation to the number that you can have set by the state or anybody, or it's just what you can accommodate on the nursing? all of the above okay. i mean i think um your accrediting body has to let you increase the size of the program um your teacher your student teacher ratio is really critical and the probably the hardest piece to to expand is your opportunities for clinical placements and so one of the you know what what do you need to increase the nursing program sometimes it's the access to clinical programs which are a part of this whole um, you know, a lot of this instruction is, is through the clinical programs. So um, is it infinite? No. I mean, com community college presidents tease each other about, you know, we, you lose money on every nurse. We do in terms of what it costs to train and then because of the teacher-student rate ratio. But we know that each one of those nurses is vital and they're making a wonderful wage and it's good for their, you know, for themselves, for their families and for the community. So we're going to do as much as we can to meet the need here. Um, we're really good at it for one thing. Um, and we have built a program. This is probably more than you want to know, isn't it? Okay. Um, okay. So, so you start nursing <coughs> with a certified nursing assistant program. So we've got lots of those. It's a six-week program, that's how you get started. And then we have a licensed practical nurse program, which used to be the standard, and then it sort of went out of fashion, and now it's back in. Uh, and then we have a registered nurse. And so we are able to bridge all of those, that your LPN training goes into your RN training. And then we have a, an arrangement with UNC Greensboro where they, they send faculty to us to help our students get an RN, a BSN, Bachelor of Science in Nursing which is really the gold standard. And so we've got that whole thing set up. It's working very, very well, and we're having excellent results. 
And is this increase of the 80 for registered nurses, or is it broken up among the LPN and registered? Uh, it's registered nurses. Okay. It's registered nurses. Uh, because the LPNs can go into that program, so it's, it's, a, it's the pipeline. Oh, yes, of course. Definitely. Definitely, definitely. Um, so here's the Advanced Technology Center. This is a fake picture, but it looks just like that now, except for the grass. And um, we will get a certificate of occupancy, we think, in June. And we will have classes in this particular building in August, and it's done very well. Um, so at this point, uh, I want to thank you for the support for this building in particular, which I think will be a, a real flagship. As you know, it's on donated land from uh, David Murdoch, that's three acres. And then uh, we were able to get the bond issue plus the support from this group, uh, from the county commission. And there's, a, there's some educate, wait a minute, economic development administration money as well. We got that grant just recently that will also be added to, uh, to this building so that we can build out uh, the flex lab and a few other things like that. So this is going well, other than the timing of the EDA grant, which was not going well. Um, but when you close the government, things don't come in on time. Um, but otherwise, it's been a great experience to build it. And I'm going to turn this uh, clicker over to uh, Jonathan Chamberlain, who's our Chief Officer of College Environment. Thank for you. Requests. Uh, we're going to actually walk through the uh, our budget request. Uh, this uh, uh, is actually the uh, the forms that we submitted on. So uh, you'll uh, uh, hopefully staff will recognize these. Um, our request this year is for 7.363 million. Uh, that's broken down uh, 3,402,000 uh, 3, for current operating and uh, 3,961,000 for our capital budget request. The current operating has an expansion um, over the previous year of 472,000, which includes 452,000 uh, for the 12-month of operation of the Advanced Technology Center. So, uh, um, so that's uh, to be expected. It includes $20,000 for anticipated escalation in costs of commodities, energy, and that sort of thing. These are the capital budget requests. Uh, county staff asked us for our list, and uh, uh, rather than strain your eyes on that, we'll walk through the individual pages that we submitted. Um, key amongst these are our first priority, which is uh, continuing the air conditioning unit replacement uh, at uh, CBTC. Um, we've, well, you're right, that is magic. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've replaced approximately half the units on the roof uh, in uh, phase one and two of that uh, replacement project. We'd like to go ahead and finish out the remainder uh, in this year if we could. So I think the word like is maybe light. Well, that's correct. Uh, the units have been failing on a regular basis, so uh, uh, so we'll be forced to replace um, quite a few of them over the year. If, if we're allowed to do it as a project, we're able to make it a comprehensive project, plan in some efficiencies and some elements of uh, uh, combining the units, uh, making improvements that we wouldn't if we just had to replace unit by unit in kind as it failed. So. Uh, um, so making this a project to do it is, is beneficial to us, and we end up with a, a more efficient project at the end of it. Uh, so uh, we're hoping that we can get this approved. Second priority is uh, the uh, fire alarm replacement and mass notification system in our Building 2000 at South Campus. Uh, this fire alarm system took a lightning strike several years back. It's been limping along, um, but uh, is uh, <laughs> becoming less reliable. Uh, as the days go on, uh, we'd like to replace that. Uh, mass notification is a public safety feature that uh, will allow us to com communicate by voice to uh, uh, the occupants of the building, and, and we're rolling that out college-wide, including up in Rowan County. A third priority is a new roof on Building 2000. That roof is now over 20 years old, and uh, uh, it uh, is uh, past its anticipated useful life. Uh, hasn't created significant damage, but the uh, annual maintenance that we're spending on it now makes it worthwhile to go ahead and make that replacement. And that amount is 315000 Correct. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Spalding mentioned the uh, motorsports program uh, at the uh, Annex, the former radiator shop at uh, our CBTC campus. Um, uh, we're requesting uh, 756000 uh, uh, to uh, do that. That would complete the renovation of that building and the conversion of it from its uh, former days as radiator shop into an educational facility. Yeah, I just want to pause and say the college through the 2016 state bond issue bought this building also put about five hundred thousand dollars worth of improvements into it uh, through the same bond and then uh, through the consensus I guess of the county commission we were able to get the golden leaf grant which again was another almost five hundred thousand dollars of investment in this building uh, so we're very very happy that so much of it has been not on the county uh, yet, but we do want to ask for the rest of it for the motorsports program for 756,000. South Campus Building 1000. This was our uh, original building on South Campus, getting uh, long in tooth uh, in several areas and uh, uh, needs some HVAC plumbing uh, renovations as well as uh, some uh, uh, movement of functions around inside the building. Uh, we would also improve the uh, video surveillance and uh, fire alarm uh, mass notification in that building. We like to make our campuses as energy efficient as possible. Um, we've been working with uh, Duke Energy on uh, several of our buildings to uh, uh, get their participation in our energy efficiency upgrades. Unfortunately, at South Campus, the way it's served, it doesn't qualify for uh, the program that we've taken most advantage of with Duke. But we can make um, a prescriptive improvement where we will get funding back from them as we do energy efficiency projects. But $110,000, that is essentially replacing the parking lot lighting with high efficiency LED lighting. And you can see in the notes that it's a five year payback um, to invest in this and over time it pays itself. Yeah, very, pays back. very attractive return. Next is uh, the, uh, what we call the acquisition of the donut hole. You'll recall that uh, with uh, the county commission's uh, uh, funding, we acquired the properties across Trinity Church Road from our south campus. That really locks in our future at uh, that site, which is uh, centrally located in Cabarrus County. We're very happy with that location. Uh, there is one home site um, there that uh, remains to be acquired. Uh, it's in yellow on the diagram there and uh, we would like to acquire that. Our Learning Resource Center, a library to most people out there, uh, is in Building 1000, our original building. Um, uh, given the uh, configuration of that building, it's, it's not particularly efficiently operated and uh, we'd like to move that uh, into one of the other buildings where we have, uh, particularly when motorsports management moves out, we'd like to move it into building 2000. Um, and that will allow us to uh, consolidate it into a single space. Uh, uh, the librarians appreciate being able to uh, monitor people as they come in and out and, and uh, keep their, uh, uh, their stock of books intact. So uh, we'd like that. Uh, that, that is a million one hundred and eleven thousand dollar project. So I think that that's our, that's our list for this year, um, and it's prioritized by our need. Um, and so we appreciate your, your support of that. Um, earlier this year, uh, the state of North Carolina proposed a bond issue for the K through 12 system and the community college system. Uh, the House has picked that up as an option. The Senate has said it's a pay-as-you-go kind of thing, and right now neither of those proposals are moving forward. Uh, but uh, in, a, in preparation for that, the state of the community college system asked us for our projects for that list if there had been a bond issue. And so we put forward an idea, a proposal for a new building for South Campus for Cabarrus County. For Rowan County, we put forward a new building, which would be more of an industrial building for them um, as, the, as their project. And so we have been meeting with each county to talk about if there is a bond issue, this is what we sent ahead in proposal. Um, I don't expect that there will be a bond issue in Cabarrus County or statewide, but it's very likely that Rowan County will have one. 
Uh, they are very um, jealous, I guess, of the Advanced Technology Center, and they want one too. And so they are about ready to, they can get one if we can pass the bond there. So I, you can anticipate that uh, going forward. Our, our board has already uh, acted on proposing this kind of thing. Um, so that's an anticipated need that will happen in Rowan County. Um, here you can see that uh, your growth and our growth are kind of simultaneous and that um, the number of students who are taking courses continue to grow here uh, and that, that, that that really grew, even though the, the college grew by 7%, when you factor into just the Cabarrus piece of that, that's really the 8.64%. So it's the lion's share of the, the growth and it's outpacing the population growth of, of Cabarrus County. So we're very happy that people are accessing our, um, our courses, our degrees, our programs of all sorts. And so we want to be able to continue those. And so you're the biggest partner that we have with that, um, that make our facilities such that we can offer new programs and serve new students. Uh, so I think you've got a couple other things just to say a little bit about this sure. and then we'll go on. <coughs> We really wanted to express in the coming years, uh, these are our anticipated needs in Cabarrus County. Uh, we've recognized a growth in transfer related programs, sciences, art, and math uh, as those students get their first two years uh, out of the way very cost effectively at the college before moving on to the uh, university system. Um, we need to keep pace with that growth and, and we really believe that we're lockstep with the county's growth or in fact as Dr. Spaulding described slightly uh, elevated and uh, there's a new building there. Um, county staff asked us to project uh, some new projects and we identified one as building 4,000 on South Campus. That would be this um, classroom and lab building that would support science and arts and math. Um, uh, Dr. Spalding also mentioned the state bond and our system's uh, request for projects there. Um, we opted to propose a different project to them. Uh, we described it as a multi-purpose building. Um, this would be located on the new properties that we've acquired across the street and quite frankly we proposed it to the state in that bond because it has quite a bit of infrastructure costs that goes along with being the first building being constructed and we were hoping that if the state chose to fund it um, it would be more attractive to us to have a lot of that infrastructure paid for with state funds as opposed to local funds. Um, that building focuses on corporate and continuing education growth, uh, which is significant. You didn't really see it in the numbers that we showed, uh, the split between Rowan and Cabarrus County and, and the, uh, the FTE growth, but uh, at our South Campus, we're seeing more and more uh, corporate education coming in. These are typically um, one day to four day, five day classes um, where we will offer uh, corporations the opportunity to come in for a fee and, uh, and train them in the uh, elements that they need. Uh, quite a bit of law enforcement training going on there. We are a testing center for uh, law enforcement and that actually uses quite a bit of space and that really speaks to the large meeting space that we're also seeing as a need. Um, that uh, a flexible meeting space that would allow for some of these larger gatherings uh, that we have uh, th throughout Cabarrus County, including at our NCRC campus, but also at South Campus. So uh, we feel that that's a, a need that, that we would like to have met. And then finally, acquiring adjacent properties. Uh, uh, when you're in a campus situation, you're always looking to uh, the adjacent property owners, and you certainly would rather uh, uh, lock in properties adjacent to you, then let somebody else acquire those. Um, PSNC has indicated that uh, they would like to find a replacement for the piece of property that they have adjacent to us for the functions that they perform there. And so we're keeping a close eye and having conversation with PSNC about uh, that property and the potential to acquire it. So uh, uh, the, these are future. We are not requesting those funds, but uh, we wanted to make sure that you were aware of our, our ideas for the future. And so this is, in closing, I think we, we uh, are ready for any kinds of questions, but we very much appreciate your support. We uh, have been working closely with economic development for jobs uh, and, and recruitment of new businesses. Um, we're building the Advanced Technology Center, which will be a great home for innovation and a, I guess a beacon for, for new jobs and for 
hopefully for students who will want to go into STEM and other kinds of industrial programs that don't look like industrial programs anymore. So um, these, are, these are jobs that we cannot fill because we can't recruit all those students. And so this will be a, a great way for students to see what, what those jobs look like and how to prepare for them. So that's how we're preparing for the future and uh, you all are our key partner for that. Um, I do want to mention that the, uh, the city of Kannapolis and Castle and Cook and the college were recognized as partners of the year for the kinds of work that was done on College Station and getting the property for the Advanced Technology Center. So we are always looking for help. It was nice to get it from the city um, and we're always looking for help from you uh, so that we can do our jobs better and we can serve this community better. So thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Questions for Dr. Spaulding or Jonathan? Well, I don't really have questions, but more some comments. Um, the statistic I saw is 65% of workers will need some type of post-secondary training, many of which will come through a community college system. That's right. And mm -hmm. that in 2020, next year, the United States will fall 5 million workers short that have the necessary required training for positions that are available. Cabarrus County is sitting at about 46% of having mm -hmm. those kinds of certificates, diplomas, yeah. in post-secondary education. And it's, it, I mean, it's huge. It's kind of interesting that, because um, I think that's, for me to say 2020, I remind high school students, uh, that's next year, guys. <laughs> and there's 5 million nationwide that are people who did not have the training that they need. The other thing that I wanted to comment about, um, two things. Um, the Taste of Industry event that you recently had, excellent. Thank you. Um, your best salespeople are those instructors. Um, even when they talk so far over everybody's head, except for one math teacher that came with me, who could not <laughs> stop writing down notes to use in our math class. The rest of us sat there were going, I don't know anything about ACDC current, but boy, was he excited <laughs> yes. in his presentation. and. Um, um, the guy uh, downstairs with all he was getting a whole lot of machinery to come in um, the um, welding or CNC machine CNC machine okay he was well welding also but CNC machining that's just a fascinating shot to go into and I'd laugh when people go into manufacturing facilities which I would call that as a training facility and they they're surprised how clean it is and um, you know, so he is an excellent uh, representative for you. Thank you. The welding instructor and female welding instructor mm -hmm. was was quite exciting. They are coming with the equipment next Friday Ooh. and meeting with I don't know how many students and letting them use your virtual reality welding portable thingy. Yep. Um, is that a technical term? Yeah, that's a technical <laughs> trainer. <laughs> Trainer, trainer, whatever. Yes. Virtual it was, trainer. He was a really cool virtual reality welding trainer. Mm -hmm. um, but he's coming and yeah. we'll be back every semester. That's great. I can already tell you that. He was yeah. extremely nice and it was it was really cool to see the female student, welding student and your female instructor in welding. Yes. And um, as part of Taste of Industry, I was fortunate enough to go and tour Power Curbers mm -hmm. with that same grant that you have for that. Um, mm -hmm really interesting um, facility. I'm looking forward to the other tours that will be part of that grant, but uh, really, really cool. And um, in response to your college and career promise programs that are um, expanding, uh, whirlwind expanding, uh, I think that students in Cabarrus County would like to participate in your fire classes in the afternoon in your fire program, especially ones at a high school that's located not far from your north campus uh -huh. and is very convenient and there are students who are begging for that opportunity um, which uh, at least the initial response was that we were not on the list it, the Rowan students were but they had not looked at all of the Cabarrus County students so I can tell you that I can get you quite a few students who would be interested in that program okay so we'll, we'll so, talk more about the fire because we are standing up the program at Rowan just like mm -hmm. you said um, and there's more to be said about National Science Foundation grants and other kinds of women in technology mm -hmm. that you've already identified. Um, and just as maybe a segue to, 
to going out to the Speedway in a minute is that we've hired uh, a very good program manager who knows the industry and uh, the faculty person is a woman who came from Canada to take our program 15 years ago and wanted to teach in the program has gotten her master's degree now and she is now our faculty member. Well, and seated behind you now are a number of our volunteer firefighting uh, captains and board chairs because they will be presenting in a moment. Sure. Um, but I would say that if, if for the other commissioners, if you not have not had an opportunity to go up there and see the um, facility that, that you have, uh, unfortunately, in Rowan County, but nonetheless, <laughs> very accessible for Cabarrus County. Um, they have a phenomenal, you have a phenomenal facility with the big burn building yep. and the towers, everything else. I mean, it, it is top notch. And I know you're expanding out there too, I think. That's so. right. We're building another tower for more training out there. So it'll be more capacity. So we, that, that, we're thrilled by that. I will uh, mention if, you, if you're looking for a field trip, uh, A.L. Brown and the welding program there is a great partnership that we have with, again, CTE, and it's our full-time faculty, and they're, they're uh, students who are very interested in it and doing well, and we have graduates from that program. Um, and that's another model, just like the uh, College Station is for cosmetology. There's a lot of really good synergy between these, uh, the school system and the college, and so we're trying to build that pipeline for uh, for that post-secondary education and the, the, the job training and uh, job development for the future. So um, where we know there's a need, we will try and fill it. Thank you for your order in advance. Um, but we are continually trying to, uh, to meet the needs of the community. So on fire training, for example, we're the largest fire trainer in the state. We, tra we trained over 60,000 people over the last, I guess, few years anyway. Um, and so we have huge number of certificates. Uh, we do many things now in innovation on that group. So they are coming to us because we have excellent trainers, we have really good space, and we'll continue to invest in that. And we're certainly, even though it's in Rowan County, uh, you know, absolutely, we want to serve Caveras County. And since you mentioned the, um, the welding program, mm -hmm. uh, the last out and about in Caveras County that I did was with one of your, their students who is in the pre-apprenticeship program at Wayne Brothers. Uh -huh. And um, uh, people get nervous when they get on camera. He was a wonderful young man. And we talked a lot, but then off camera, we had the conversation that I wish had been on camera. Oh. Because what he said was, I never thought that this would have, that I would have this opportunity. I didn't think I needed to go to high school. My well, or, I mean, that it wasn't that important to me. Mm. Um, but my grandmother thought it was important. So I knew that was there, but at the same time, you know, eh, so the welding instructor would call me and make sure that I was showing up for class and would call me and ask me, you know, what's going on, what is this? And he said that with the pre-apprenticeship program that he's with at Wayne Brothers, that he has bought three cars and a house. Whoa. And that his grandmother is just can't believe how how well he turned out because as he put it to me I grew up in a really bad neighborhood and I shouldn't be able to I should never have had the opportunity to do these things and that's what that welding program at A.L. Brown did for him and what your welding instructor did for him and um, when we got done um, our camera guy said you can't do another one like these because I'm starting to cry Aww. so um, but you need to know that too but it unfortunately that part was off campus yeah. but, I mean off camera sure. but he was just he was just phenomenal so um great shout out to that program it's wonderful um, yeah we hear that all the time i and, know you do and but we have a lot of faculty that call students <laughs> that's how we've gotten our retention up that's how we've gotten our enrollment up thank you very much and i just want to make sure anytime anybody wanna, that watches this that they yeah. know that well, you if you want to get are, more speeches for us we're yeah, yeah you're on it thank you, you very truly much are i appreciate making it. a difference in both counties and a difference not just for the community college system or whatever but you're truly making a difference for um the people who live here mm -hmm. and people who are moving here because of your programs that's that was true. another lady i met at taste of industry um i forgot where she came from i'm going to say ohio which is probably wrong but she said i came here for this program so you know kudos you're doing a great job thank you very much appreciate that i have just one quick question in, in a, one of the previous slides that you talked about the the <coughs> split students between Ryan and Cabarrus. It's approximately 85 percent 
So the other 15%, I assume, live in counties that have community colleges but choose to come here? Or are there counties that, that don't? And I guess the other assumption would be maybe those Stanley, Rowan, right. uh, not Rowan, but Davie or Davidson. Mecklenburg. Just, who, Mecklenburg. So <laughs> what, what are you doing to attract students that are leaving where they could go or it's more local or closer to, to come to Rowan? We, we don't have any specific marketing plan to try and recruit people from out of Ohio or Canada or Iredale or any place in particular. We do have some programs that those community colleges don't have, so they'll come for the programs and they'll come if they have a great experience. Um, sometimes they don't want the traffic of Mecklenburg, for example, and they would rather come to South Campus. So um, I think there's some of that. Also, our online program can be anywhere, and that's growing uh, greatly. And so if you, we have excellent um, online programs. We have nine completely online degree programs. And so if you want to have a complete online program, there are not that many community colleges in North Carolina that have the whole degree. And so that's an area that distinguishes us. <coughs> and our faculty go through huge amounts of professional development. Uh, they are trained in what's called Quality Matters, which does a wonderful job of making sure that this is an engaging experience. It's not, I mean, if you've never taken an online class, you miss the bad parts of the old days. Now it's really good. Um, with e-books and uh, videos that are embedded and other kinds of things like that. So um, that's, I think, is why people are coming uh, to Rowan Cabarrus is because of uh, word of mouth, because we're not, I mean, we've got some commercials, we've got some radio, we've got some other kinds of things. We're, we are advertising on social media, and that's another way that we would have them. Well, thank you for all, all your hard work and, you. and for your success, and uh, it is certainly, uh, 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 a benefit to the county to have you guys doing as well as you are and, and working as hard as you are out there so thank you very thank much thank you appreciate your support right other questions or comments i have a question you guys you, you have a lot of capital needs as well as our high our schools have a lot of capital needs and we're trying to keep up some of the newer schools now are are creating flexible classroom space large gyms plus our arena has a lot of large meeting spaces are there any conversations going on to use those new schools that are flex have flex flexible space in the evenings or in the summer or using our arena uh, for some of those needs that you have in the future because based on all of the other needs those needs that you just identified are going to be pretty far out um, so, and if there's enhancements to the meeting space at the arena, it would be cheaper for us to make those enhancements to those facilities out there than to build a brand new facility. So, I don't know, I am just wondering if those conversations are happening or can we help facilitate those conversations? Um, we've had some general conversations um, and we can certainly have some more of them. So, I think we're, we're interested in talking about that. Uh, we're also, I mean, part of what we're doing with the advent of online is trying to build a campus where students want to come for all kinds of reasons, which would be the services that they would get and the seminars and the face-to-face -face contact that they would have with their faculty. So I think we're looking at a different future than what we've seen in the past also. And so, you know, with uh, videos and things like that, um, we, we are always looking at what does the future hold. So I think we, we can engage in those conversations. Thank you. If, if I can add on that, um, the uh, use of uh, high schools in the evening, uh, unfortunately our campuses are, uh, um, there's plenty of capacity in the evening for the students that we find that want to take those classes in the evening. So we've never really had the need to, um, to reach out to the high schools in that. And uh, so it's those core hours during the day that we find the majority of our classes uh, and our students want to take those classes and so that really drives a lot of the need for the facilities that we have mm -hmm. um, and of course at the high schools you don't necessarily want to have uh, your adult learners and your high school age learners uh, co-located uh, during that period of time so uh, so we're, we're certainly open and uh, but uh, that that has been our experience thus right. far and our continuing ed classes are all over the place so we'll give you that list too about sure. where we're already right. um, have our programs housed in different kinds of they're not just high schools or 
they, but they may be churches and other kinds of sure. places too. Yeah. And I know if, if they're scheduling openings at the arena, those are all in midweek during the week. Hmm. The weekends are not there, and I know you guys are you, your your events would be during the week. So I think that would be a, a good conversation to have okay. that we could help sure. with some of that. that would be, space. Yeah, let's do that. So. Thank you. Thank you for all the conversation. It has been my pleasure to serve on the Community College Board of Trustees for the past five or six years, I guess, now. So there are a lot of things I could say if we weren't already a half hour behind right. <laughs> uh, on our schedule. But I, I do want to mention um, uh, President Spalding talked about the awards with Castle and Cook and the city of Kannapolis, and that is a perfect example of collaborations that we have all talked about so much and trying to form relationships between entities and, and, and that's a, a wonderful example. The one thing that she failed to mention mm -hmm. was that in addition to that award, which was statewide, um, uh, President Spalding was also named the Community College President of the Year for the state of North Carolina this past year, which is a very impressive uh, honor and we certainly appreciate what you do thank you very much appreciate that mm -hmm. great thank you thank you thank you okay we we did we are scheduled for a 15 minute break so if we could try to get back at a quarter till or as close as possible that would be great I uh, hope everybody enjoyed that brief break and sorry we're a little behind schedule and I apologize to our folks that have been waiting. Uh, but while, while you're finishing up with your snacks, we'll go ahead and get started back. So we're happy to have Steve Langer, our fire marshal, here to begin that discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, this evening we have three fire departments here uh, requesting a tax increase in their fire district tax. Uh, first up, we have the Flow Store Fire Department. We have Board President Ken Nichols, as well as Chief Joy Houston. Um, in your uh, packet, uh, Kristen created some nice little spreadsheets. You should be able to see that the tax rate history going back to 2012 for all of the fire departments, as well as a spreadsheet showing you the valuation uh, of the districts the requested tax increase and then the last column i guess probably the most important the anticipated revenue uh, off of that tax increase so we'll turn it over to uh, mr nichols and chief houston good evening <clears throat> is this on good evening uh, i appreciate being here thank you for your time and uh, i'll let our chief joey houston jump in and walk you through the PowerPoint presentation. You want to run the meeting technical question there? Yeah. You don't want firemen messing with buttons? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Joey Houston, the Chief of Flow Store Fire Department. Uh, just, we'll keep it kind of brief. Uh, we'll kind of tell you what we're asking for. And since you don't ever really get to see us other than when we're asking for something, we'll tell you what's going on with us and also tell you what our plan is for our, our uh, funding. So. Uh, so basically we're asking for a one cent tax increase uh, to increase our staffing level. Uh, currently we have one person 24 seven uh, with the increase. We'll be uh, adding another person to go to two person, two people 24 seven. And then obviously we'll be supplemented with our other members who would uh, come back for calls. Uh, so kind of what's been going on with us lately. We've been kind of busy the uh, past couple of years. Uh, back in November, we went through our state ISO inspection. Uh, everything went pretty good. Uh, we were able to lower our rating uh, for you know, over 90% of our residents. Uh, we were previously a 5.9, um, but our, uh, the 5 rating only applied to those people that were within 1,000 feet of a hydrant. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next one. Um, with the new rating, uh, we're basically a 4.9E, so, but the difference on this one is uh, we complete our water hall certification, so if anyone is within five miles of our current station uh, is now a four. So that's pretty much everybody. We only have a small area that's still a nine. Um, and the, the water hall was a big part of that because you know, less than 30% of our area has hydrants. So that's the only way that we can really get water in there. And 
by doing some training and also working with our neighboring departments who helps out a lot. Uh, you know, we went through the testing process on that and we were able to pass it and that's kind of what helped, you know, biggest drive behind us being able to lower that rating for most everybody. So, um, obviously we like to, you know, goal is to kind of drop it for everyone, but that's kind of something we can't really deal with at the moment. So, but uh, we're pretty happy with that for right now. So, uh, also within the past year, we've become a medium rescue provider uh, that basically just certifies us to do vehicle extrications, certain type of rescues. Uh, it's not a new service that we're providing, but it's something that we're now certified to do. We've uh, uh, proven to the state that we have the required equipment, enough trained personnel to be able to do this. Uh, it's kind of, you know, people can drive without a license, but you know, now we're licensed to drive technically. You know, we're kind of, we're, we have that in our corner. So like I said, it's nothing new, but it's just something to, you know, say that we are certified to do what we're doing. So, um, I believe it was two years ago, we did a tax increase to be able to staff our station 24 seven. Uh, and with that came, uh, you know, some station <coughs> improvements to be able to house someone overnight. Uh, but that has been has helped us out a lot uh, as you can see there you know previously we only had daytime coverage and nighttime was run by volunteers so our overall average response time previously was seven minutes 33 seconds now our, you know our response time is basically from the time when we get the call to the time you know our first unit arrives uh, after we went to the 24-hour staffing that uh, number decreased down to five minutes and 49 seconds you know that's overall average Obviously, some calls less, some a little more, but overall average is, is pretty good. So uh, we're pretty happy with how that's that's worked out. Um, last year, with a little bit of additional funding we had, we did add a second person during the day, um, eight hours a day, five days a week. And that has been very beneficial. Uh, it gets, just gives a second person to you know, kind of make something happen. You know. Um, <clears throat> So what the request is for, basically we're asking for a one cent increase. We'll go from six cents to seven cents, uh, be able to staff two firefighters 24 seven. Uh, obviously it, like I said, it gives us a second person to be able to make something happen or other members, you know, maybe coming from home, they may be coming from the grocery store, maybe coming from, you know, you don't know where they're coming from. So it's good to have somebody else with you when you pull up in case there's nobody else that has showed up yet. Um, obviously you can make more happen with two than with one. Uh, it's something that our members have asked for as well, um, just for help with navigating. You know, country roads at night, it's hard to find some houses that are off the road, so it's good to have a, a second person with you to help find that, and obviously that helps us get there quicker. Um, and even with that and for, you know, asking for a second person, we're, we're still getting good response from our members coming back. Uh, we still have an overall average of six people per call. So, you know, some calls less, some calls more. But uh, our members are still involved. We're still, you know, pretty community-based and have good involvement. So we're obviously we want to progress, but we're trying to progress and, you know, a quietly progress so that we can still keep all our, our, you know, our community members involved and, you know, still have, give a good response out of everyone. So I'd like to say too that even with this one cent increase, the department would still be would still have one of the lowest tax rates of any of the volunteer fire departments in the county. Uh, you know, we, we continue to be a very conservative fire department. And as you can see, the money we're asking for is simply going to improve staffing to provide that better response to the community. That's pretty much it for us. Like I said, it's pretty simple. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll just got one question, real quick. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, how how are you doing as far as the number of volunteers? Are you holding your own? You losing? You gaining? We're holding our own. Uh, we haven't really gained as much. Uh, we've been uh, we put in for a grant this past year to kind of help with uh, you know some programs, uh, some money to put towards you know recruitment and retention, um, and that's something that we need to work on. We've this, since the ISO inspection has been done, we've kind of been working on updating some of our guidelines and trying to clean up our application process. So when we do make a push, it's pretty, pretty straightforward and make it simple for when we do start getting people in and uh, you know, kind of streamline things a little bit. So. With the better rating, even with the tax increase, is it a still a net reduction to the property owner? 
I guess it depends on your residence. I know mine, mine it is. Uh, it's, I can't remember the numbers, but I think my insurance was going down a hundred dollars. And with this, you know, my tax may go up like 20 or $30. Yeah. So. Okay. And I can tell you, it'll depend on their policy and their plans and what all they have insured. Um, I know, uh, Mr. Holloway has some examples of how, uh, his insurance was affected with Mount Pleasant's lower rating. Um, and it can be several hundred dollars, uh, depending on their policy and how it's structured. On the um, average response time that you talked about, is are there guidelines for that that are recommended, or it's just there how does is. that work? Uh, yeah, there's NFPA standards um, that kind of covers. There's NFPA standard for career departments as well as volunteer departments that kind of covers based on whether it's suburban, rural, as to uh, estimated time that the department arrives, as well as the number of personnel that they would have on a scene in a given time. Okay, any other questions? Chief, how, how's the, um, has the manpower unit that the county has run in with you guys, has that helped? Uh, I mean, there's only select calls that they come with us on. Um, you know, they, they've helped, obviously, when they come with us, but uh, you know, they come more on bigger stuff, you know, you know pin-ins or fires, you know, so obviously other calls we have to kind of manage ourselves, so, but, uh, I don't know how many calls they've come with us on, to be honest with you. Okay. And we could look and tell you how many they have went to each district, if it was something you wanted to know. And I can tell you that through the grading process with the ISO, um, uh, they were able to provide some point benefits um, to their ISO grading. Um, uh, there's been changes to the ISO uh, as it relates to uh, the personnel points that departments can get and flow store um, definitely was able to benefit from that change um, normally you do not see a volunteer department max out personnel credit on the ISO rating um, but they almost maxed it out uh, and that's due to the changes they were able to receive credit from the squad as well as Midland and Harrisburg because they respond to 100% of their district so it was definitely a, a benefit in that aspect that um, helped them in, in a lot of points. Okay, other <clears throat> questions or comments? <coughs> All right, we thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you for your time. Uh, so next up we have uh, the Midland Fire Department. Uh, we have uh, Chief Alan Burnett as well as Board President uh, Mr. Udi, um, Midland is requesting a two cent increase on their fire tax. Oh, I'm sorry, we also have their Deputy Chief here with us as well. I'm Joe Udi. Um, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to be in front of you and, uh, and present our case. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, myself, I was born in this department literally. My father was a a charter member in 1955 and I've been through the chicken dinners and, and raising money literally and when the calls went out through the uh, funeral home to the everybody's landline uh, with that being said I like to say that we do take this job serious we take the money serious because we feel like we've been charged with being good stewards of the community's money and we believe that the community owns this department. With that being said, I would like to uh, introduce you to our chief, Chief Alan Burnett, and let him make the presentation. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, we are requesting at Midland a two cent tax increase. We are currently at eight cents per hundred dollars, and we're requesting to go to 10 cents. Uh, this is in what this will allow us to do is to, we man two, we run two stations, one on 2427, just uh, east of Flow Store Road and one on Midland, south of the 601-2427 intersection. We man the two stations around the clock with two personnel as it stands at eight cent. Uh, the additional monies would allow us to put a third man on at each station 24 hours a day around the clock with our goal being four 
on each truck around the clock. But, you know, you have to crawl before you can walk, and as the town and the area grows, the tax base grows, hopefully down the road we'll be able to apply the fourth person. But at this point, the monies will allow us to put the third person on each station. The additional funds will also provide for apparatus upgrades. We currently have one engine company that's a 1999 model. It's 20 years old. We have one tanker that is a 1990 model. It was actually, we bought it for Flow Store when they had upgraded. Uh, it needs replacing. We have one tanker that's a 95 model, which is uh, 24 years old now. We have, over the past years, we have concentrated on personnel. You could have all the shiny fire equipment, all the bells and whistles, but I have not seen a truck yet that's going to drive itself there and pull the hose and put the fire out. It takes people. It takes personnel. And that's where a lot of our funds has went toward is part-time personnel, ensuring that we had trained, properly equipped firefighters on the scene. Well, now it has come to the time that we are going to have to upgrade equipment. Uh, we are currently looking at upgrading to a quint, a 70, 75-foot ladder, which will run out as an engine company and give us the aerial capabilities that we need at Midland. And with that, we can sort of kill two birds with one stone. That replaces an engine company and gives us the aerial. Uh, with the tankers being replaced, not in this current upcoming budget year, but in the as soon as we can, you know, acquire the monies to take care of that. Uh, the reason we're needing the extra personnel and the latter company, we're experiencing a lot of growth in Midland, a lot of residential, uh, have two big <coughs> projects right now that's already breaking ground. Uh, we have a lot of industrial base at Midland, uh, Corning, I, the new IPG plant. You know, you're talking plants that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars in one case it has a lot of a lot of elements to it. Everything down there is either hot, poisonous, or flammable, or high voltage. We've got to have trained personnel when we go in there. Uh, we, we, this is not just about fighting a barn fire like it used to be in the days. Uh, so volunteers, we have depended on them for many years. I was a volunteer myself. I joined when I was 16. I think our board president did here, and I know uh, Jason Cook here started out at 16 Midlands as a junior firefighter. The volunteers are getting harder to come by. We have had quite a few applications at Midland for people wanting to volunteer. They live in Matthews, Concord, Kannapolis, somewhere that don't have volunteers. The problem is if you take them on, equip them, spend the money for the insurance, the equipment, then they're not there when you need them. They might come down, hang around a little while, but they're not there at two o'clock in the morning when you've got to have them because they live 20 miles away. Or either if you do get somebody in the district, they fill out the application, then you inform them they need to go to school at RCC for about the next year and a half to two years, two nights a week and sometimes on the weekend to get firefighter one and two, all your rescue tech classes, your EMT, your driver operator, uh, just not counting all your specialty classes. Most people don't have the time, nor they do they are they willing to invest that much time or effort into being a volunteer anymore. So this is why it's important for the to be able to put the other people on. And we are currently at this point, we are undergoing looking to lower our ISO grade across the board. We've implemented the trainings, training with the numerous, our neighboring departments and are planning on hopefully sometime after January the 1st, being able to ask for the inspection that spring, somewhere around this time to be able to look to lower to across the board rating also. And Alan, I got a, um, a question. Really, it's, it's not clarification for me. I, I understand, but for the viewing public, 
particularly those that live in the Midland area. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, for, and the whole county, for that matter, goes to view this. The mm -hmm. number one question that would come into people's mind when you talk about a 75-foot ladder truck mm -hmm. in Midland, I know, I, I, if it's not our number one, our highest tax paying is this corning. And I think it's wise that we be able to take care of corning in the event they had some type of a, you know, a fire or whatever it might be. So I think it's very smart, you know, on your part to take advantage of that by getting that truck to meet that need for those people down there and of course the others. But just like it is with every fire department pretty much is the same. It's getting harder and harder to find the volunteers, and, yes, and there's a lot of reasons behind that because of the training requirements, the continuing education, and all the different things that you have to do just to become a fireman. Uh, but I would like to think, though, that uh, with your fire department being pretty good little ways away, not quite as far as northeast, but do you get some help from the squad that's up on 49? Do you ever have a need for them? Yes, and, sir. Have, they have run on them? all uh, reported structure fires with us. PNNs and they have been a big help to us. Uh, I just wish that they were closer. <laughs> yeah, but, that's, but I think yes, it's been they a are great a, they are a big help, yeah. and we yeah. that is trained personnel that I know that's coming, and whether it's the middle of the night, hopefully coming up here shortly or during the day, uh, that's more trained people. And I know just because you have six firefighters on the scene. Uh, I've got Mr. Cook here, a deputy chief. He's also captain in the city of Concord. He could tell you. Uh, they, Kadapolis had a stretch of fire today you was on. Yeah. How many firefighters probably on the scene? Uh, that was probably over 50 or so. They went fourth alarm. Fourth alarm on a building wow. fire in Kadapolis. So six firefighters. You take flow stores, too. They hope, will hopefully have on. You take squad 410. Uh, Georgeville has one on, none at night. Uh, you can see why we need the people. Uh, Get large, spread too thin. Even a large residential yeah. fire, you need 25 or 30 people easy on the scene. Wow. So two and three here and three there, it's still not enough. Well, just one last uh, question there, Alan. How how are you doing with volunteers? Uh, same question that I asked uh, uh, Flow Store. We have, <coughs> we are catering to the volunteers, trying to increase the volunteer base but in the past man y'all can jump at any time here in the past 10 years probably 10 to 12 years it has steadily declined and and the age the age bracket average age bracket of the uh of the volunteers has gone up and i've helped with that <laughs> proudly um and it's real hard to get the young folks involved with it. I I beat my head against the wall trying to figure that answer out. Um, I really wish there was some way we could get a hook into them, get them inside the department because, particularly when they're in high school, if you can get them out of high school and get them in the department, well, when you're 17, 18 years old, you got a lot of time and no money. Okay, so the cool place to hang out is at the fire department. So you get they get the training. They get they they get into the department. They learn what's going on, and then you know, of course, some goes off to college, and then you start your family. And when you start your family, your priorities change as a volunteer. And and I, you can ask these guys. I tell them all the time, it's God Almighty first, your family second, all this other stuff's down below. And if we could just get them in the door after they get out and get married and get on in their career, it's hard to get them inside the door. But the answer to your question, not too good. <laughs> I mean, we're trying hard, but this is constantly, every year, it's less and less uh, that you can depend on any volunteers at any given time. One of the things that you talked about just a second ago was the ladder. Um, you know, of course, we've got Corning, we've got the the new tape company that is down there, which has all got some notable fire loads associated with it, uh, which necessitates having access to a ladder. Ladders is a huge expenditure, no question about it. 
Uh, not only that, but when you start looking at the residents that are being built in community, um, there's a couple <coughs> residents that, well, actually, the houses are extremely close in terms of the footage in between them. And, and the problem that you get into, if you, go, if you get into the, the facility where it's room and contents, you can knock it down and put it out. But if it come, becomes an involved fire where it involves in structure, then you got the radiant heat this, this, and you got a house 15 to 15, 20, 20 feet away. Then it becomes a new set of problems that you're trying to keep burning down the whole block. Um, and that's another reason we need the ladders. Well, I for one appreciate everything you guys do. You've been doing it a long time too. And that's you're to be commended for that. And I thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I think I read in your material that the, the town of Midland is proposing to match this increase you're requesting in their budget as yes, well. Sir. They have it in their they right. already had the budget workshop and it is in the budget schedule for the public right. hearing. Okay. And it's recommended by the town manager. Okay. Great. Well, we thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. Thank, thank you. Appreciate you. what you do. So next up, we have uh, Mount Pleasant. We have with us uh, Town Manager uh, Randy Holloway, as well as Deputy Chief uh, Jeff Watts. Mount Pleasant is asking for a one and a half cent increase. Thank you, Steve. Commissioners, uh, county staff, thank you for allowing us to come and speak with you this evening, bring you greetings from Mayor Udy and the town board and also from Chief Jerry Taylor that is in Alaska at a wedding anniversary. So I'm surprised he chose to go to Alaska instead of being here tonight to make the presentation. I'm gonna speak briefly and then Deputy Chief Watts will actually talk about what the uh, tax increase would go for. Uh, as Steve mentioned earlier, something we're very proud of that we told the board that we would lower our ISO rating and the fire department did a very good job and lowered that rating about a year and a half ago and surprisingly, in the mail last November, I got a check from my insurance company for $650 rebate back, and my homeowner's insurance went down to about $52 a month. So I'm saving over $600 a year, and my fire insurance and my payment to the Mount Pleasant Fire Department went up about $150. So the fire department said I owed them $450, but I don't think I'm going to give them that $450. But I'm very proud. They did a good job. We went from a nine in the rural area down to a five, and in town from a six down to a four. So we're very proud of that rating. And again, thank you for letting us come tonight. I'm gonna let Chief Watts talk with you about what we need the additional increase. <coughs> How you doing this evening? Um, the town of Mount Pleasant's requesting, or Mount Pleasant Fire Department is requesting an increase in the rural tax district. Our t current tax rate is 10.3 cents. We're requesting to increase that by one and a half cents to 11.8 uh, per $100 tax value. Um, with that additional cent and a half increase, they'll generate us approximately $60,000 in revenue. What that money is going to go for is replacement of an engine company um, with an approximate cost of $600,000 to $650,000. The unit that's replacing was in an incident, or I'm sorry, it will be responding primarily to the rural fire district. Uh, the unit that it is replacing was in a serious incident accident seven years ago. Um, had significant maintenance issues and it's just no longer dependable as a frontline engine company um, to be responding to you to anything uh, over the past year or since July 1st of this past year it's spent over three months in the shop um, with repairs costing in excess of $25,000 that's actually the time that it was at the shop being repaired not counting the time that it was out of service sitting in our station waiting on mechanics to come to the station and fix it that's physically gone out of the district. Um, we want to finance that unit for 12 to 15 years with an estimated annual payment of $56,000 to $60,000 per year. And the remaining of that revenue will be going to firefighters pay raise. Uh, firefighters did not receive a pay raise this physical year. Currently we're making $11 an hour and that would increase us to $11.25 an hour. They can all go buy new pickup trucks with that 25 cents an hour. Yes, so. absolutely. Any questions? 
I just want to point out too the town has a tax rate of 50 and a half cent and 16 cent of that tax rate in the town goes to the fire department questions for Mount Pleasant I think you've explained it well thanks sir all right thank you we appreciate you being here thank you thank folks. you that's all we have for you so thank you very much okay thank you okay we um, we are now back on schedule um, so I think we had scheduled at 630 for a general board discussion um, and I'm assuming that Kristen and Lauren probably have some things to tell us <coughs> and give us yeah. colorful at least hopefully you can see it <laughs> oh wait Lauren going and start we, we are we are waiting okay. on you all right good We're evening ready. okay um, you should have four handouts here we're gonna start going over the the largest handout that's colorful um, so that is the final changes spreadsheet um, that I typically present throughout the budget process until we adopt the FY20 budget um, so like we always like to say, the budget is a living and breathing document. So what we handed out on Tuesday has already changed. So um, I'm gonna try my best to explain this to where it's not confusing. Um, so I color coordinated the final changes spreadsheet here. So hopefully you can see the different colors and follow it. So what I wanted to show was um, revenue coming in, but then also it going right back out as contributions to uh, the capital reserve fund. So um, to start out, did everyone get a copy of the spreadsheet? Yeah, okay. So to start out, um, you're seeing the proposed uh, two cent tax increase um, at the top there. So um, on the left hand column is my effect on the expenditures, on the right hand column is my effect on my revenues. Um, you can see the total general fund budget um, at the top of uh, which we discussed on Tuesday is two hundred and sixty nine million eight hundred and five thousand five hundred and ninety six dollars so if you um, follow down on the revenue column you can see the two cent property tax um, increase added is uh, the I broke it out between personal property and vehicles so if you um, add the four point two and the four hundred and seventeen thousand together for vehicle and you look on the expenditure side, you can see it offset. So that's kind of how this spreadsheet works. And I tried to color coordinate it so you could see what's going in is going right back out. So we can kind of, um, hopefully that sets the scene a little. So on the spreadsheet, the green has the two cent property tax increase. Um, and like we talked on Tuesday, we were proposing to um, move those funds to fund one time uh, projects and deferred maintenance projects. If you follow me down to, I guess that's kind of a pinky peach area color, um, you can see that that is an increase in the assessed valuation. So um, finance and our tax office um, is always making updates to the assessed valuation all throughout the budget process. So we try to keep that as current as possible. So um, increasing that valuation would result, if you take the 1.3 and then the net, or the actual decrease um, in vehicle, you get a net um, additional property tax revenue of that $1,277,38 um, that you're seeing on the expenditure side. 
Is everyone following me okay so far? Okay. Just to make sure, uh, Kristen, the, the 44573 that's decreased in valuation of the motor vehicles. Correct. Or boats and all of that. Is that all in the same category because it's tagged? Right. Yes. Well, trailers. Registered and all that. motor vehicles, yeah. 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 So then um, we wanted to show, uh, if you follow down to kind of the purplish uh, color, you can see um, the, so if we have a two cent tax increase, then we have to um, increase the incentive payments to our uh, incentives for FY20. So um, if you add all of those in incentives together, it equals 44,000. So you can see that that then would reduce the amount that you're able to fund uh, with capital reserve funds for those one-time projects. And I can, we can go back to that spreadsheet maybe after I explain this one so you can kind of see where that's um, hitting your capital reserve fund balance. So then if you move to the yellow, um, that is our JCPC um, allocations. So at the time we prepare the budget, um, we put the revenue and corresponding expenditure in an unallocated account and then wait for the board to decide what specific agencies that they want to fund throughout the year. Um, so that is, so you can see the, the 295-111 is um, reduced on both revenue and expenditure side and then the necessary agencies that were awarded, you can see the breakout there. And those net each other, so, um, but we just have to show it because I'm moving it from one account to another. And then um, following uh, down from JCPC, you can see the Cabarrus Health Alliance. Um, I did not put the school nurses in the right account. Um, I just left off that project code nurse. So the two nurses that uh, Cabarrus Health Alliance asked for, which were the part-time nurse at Kannapolis Middle and uh, the full-time nurse at their alternative schools, which uh, was the early college and the performance learning center. Um, I had it accounted for and it's accounted for in your budget books as their overall total contribution. I just need to show it in the correct account. So it's really just more of a account adjustment. So um, what's kind of what's below the line, that, that gray line there, um, and what's not colored is um, additional requests that we've received uh, so far in the budget process. So um, the first one there is a motor vehicle for $43,275. Um, that was actually already funded, part of your board contingency this year. Um, I believe you approved it the April meeting, March or April. So um, it was uh, an oversight on my part. I forgot to reduce it from the FY20 budget. So that's what this is showing. It's getting rid of that expenditure since it's already funded. Um, communications and outreach um, is requesting to fund the 25,000 for the community survey. We typically fund that um, every year. Uh, communications and Outreach is also requesting $3,600 in expenditures for live equipment, which is the ability to go live um, at different locations. And so um, you're seeing that that is showing up as an added expenditure. Um, the contribution to the ARENA fund um, is part of the CVB increase in their occupancy tax revenue and the 5% admin fee. Um, that we get and so they increased their admin portion so therefore we're having to show it as a decrease in the contribution that the general fund gives to the arena fund. Is everyone following that? You're looking at, okay. <laughs> All right, so actually if you go to this spreadsheet it might help kind of set the scene a little better. It's a smaller one and it's showing um, the arena fund contribution so when the CVB presented, um, they noted, I believe it was an increase in their retirement. So um, with that being said, they had to increase their budget and their occupancy tax revenue that they were projecting to get in. And so therefore that impacts the 5% admin fee that the county gets. So what the arena spreadsheet is showing is the um, contribution from the CVB, the 5% admin fee. So it's increasing that revenue. Oh yeah, thank you for that. And then it's, um, but it's, it's decreasing it right out because it's reducing the county contribution from the general fund to the arena fund. Does that make sense? It's, it's just more 
so accounting purposes. It decreases the amount that we're going to have to contribute. Right. To the, to the general fund, yeah. So that actually helps the general fund, I guess is a good way of putting that. Um, if you don't mind going back to the general fund tab. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, so I know you heard from um, Kevin at the last work session, I believe, on um, potential increases to recycling expenses. So I am showing um, a $65,000 um, increase in that account. And I know there might be some further discussion on that um, later. I'm showing the raise the age, which is the raising the juvenile age from under 16 to include 16 and 17 year olds um, for select offenses. Um, and so that was based on estimates that we received from our North Carolina Department of Public Safety. Um, the raise the age wouldn't be implemented until December of 2019, so we budgeted half a year's cost, and then the sheriff or the jail's division already had a portion of that already budgeted for, so that 44,000 is the remaining cost of that implementation. And then um, the contribution to the other funds, with the additional revenue that we've collected, um, we've kind of earmarked that initially to go to the Capital Reserve Fund to fund these one-time projects and deferred maintenance, but unfortunately, um, it's not gonna be enough to help us balance. So, if you follow me to your proposed one-time funding sheet, which has the deferred maintenance um, and one-time projects that we talked about on Tuesday, I did update um, the top total. Do you see where I, I took out the 44,000 for the economic development incentives because we have that money already accounted for in our additional tax revenue, so we have to back out the incentives there. And then the only um, new project I added was the security vestibule at Mount Pleasant High School. It's in the fourth section, the capital or capital outlay FMD for Cabarrus County Schools, and it's at 56,870. So if you follow this sheet all the way down, you can see that if we were to um, move the additional t two cent tax increase revenue and the additional assessed value revenue to the capital reserve fund um, you would have 74,000 to the good therefore that would need to be used to offset the expenditures noted at the bottom of your large spreadsheet which were the raise the age um, your recycling expense in order to in order to make the general fund balance that making sense so in other words there were not enough there were not enough additional revenues right outside of the two cent tax increase to fix those additional costs so she utilized a portion of that two cents in the 74,878 number we went over that this afternoon and, and it was either that or to find another revenue to increase right So are there any questions? No, nothing off the top of my head. That's a lot of information to to take in and digest. But I mean, I'm, I'm following you through it. Don't ask me to explain it once I walk <laughs> out the front door. But I mean, what you've done makes makes sense or it lines up and the, the numbers tie together. Other questions for Kristen? That's a, that's a lot of numbers to absorb. <laughs> well, hopefully the color coding helps to see what's going in is going right back out. So um, really, you know, like Pam said, the, co the amount that's not covered um, by any additional revenue is that white section at the bottom, which is why we had to pull, proposing to pull the 74,878 um, that would be in the Capital Reserve Fund to offset those other general fund operating expenses. Unfortunately, another option would be to reduce the 300,000 contingency if you choose not to do that, but those were the two places that we looked. Uh, 
have a quick question. Mr. Chairman, I think, did you go tour the Cannon Gym out at A.L. Brown? And yes, I, missed I did. That <clears throat> so the, the number that they're showing, what, what they told us yesterday and they were here, that the gym is closed and has been marked as unsafe. So is the 200000 that's shown here, do we know, does that do what needs to be done or is that just kind of a – We do not know. We've oh. asked them to update their estimate to have somebody come out and, and review the current situation of the building. Uh, hopefully that will get done in the next couple of weeks. and then. Uh, but this is what they had projected in their budget request at 200000 But, no, we do not know if that's enough. Could be not nearly enough. Could be too much right. uh, at this point. And they have engaged an engineering firm? Uh, not yet. We've got an estimate. Okay. And we're waiting for them to it, – it's – probably 90 days old, so we're trying to get an updated estimate so that we can go ahead and help them with that. And that's it's somewhere $12,000 right now. So, Other, And you, I may have been looking at something while you, you were sure. still explaining. No so, I may have been, so the four numbers, the five numbers, four numbers at the bottom, well, those are big numbers. So where, where and what are those? Those are – that's – Oh, okay. Where so, are those that's, yeah, that's from? a good question. I didn't even touch on that. So um, what that is is just if you subtotal – all of what I just went over in the color and then the left and the white, that is what you would be um, adding to your general fund budget. So that's taking your top general fund proposed budget of the 269-805-596 plus the $5,979,172 in additional revenue and then offsetting expenditures to get a new general fund um, total of $275,784.768. Does that, okay. Is that what is that the those numbers you were Those are big numbers about? too, but those aren't the oh, four okay, numbers I was talking about. The, <laughs> well, the there's small, <laughs> the smaller sheet. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> this, yeah, those okay. four numbers at the bottom. It yeah. looks like they're just it's a it's, it's a subtotal of a maybe this. It is. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Okay. Yeah. So um, Mike had asked just to group them into kind of categories, just so you would have a general idea mm -hmm. of. What are the different types of projects and you know just um how extensive the needs are okay yeah. these, these are the one-time projects that we somewhat discussed and identified the other day or tuesday night um and again if, if the tax two cent tax increase the revenue is resulting from that these would be the one-time expenses for fiscal year 2020 mm -hmm. and then they would go away and then the recurring expenses of operating the two new schools would would take that two cents forward yes. the available balance here Kristen the 175 and we're is it 175 but we're taking away the 59.6 for uh, the vestibule at Mount Pleasant is that correct sorry where are you seeing the 175 on, on the proposed one-time funding that that was the the number Tuesday night. Oh yes. Yeah. So so now that number is less the uh, fifty nine something. The fifty six eight seventy. Yeah, fifty six eight seventy, and also the forty four for the economic development incentives. Yeah. Okay. Um, you should. We can hand you an updated copy. Oh, you have one. Okay. Yeah, I think. So do do you understand? I didn't. Oh, okay, it it sure. wasn't in my. Do you package. understand this the increase in the economic development incentives? It's a yeah. higher tax rate, right. therefore they're going right. to be paying higher taxes. Right. Therefore, we have to pay out. Right. Yeah. There's a smaller piece of paper kind of given. Yeah. There's an updated one. There's a lot of handouts. Yeah, I didn't see it. I had two of those, though. I had oh, two. that's probably the problem. I had two of those. Thank you. I'll make a general comment um, that is no surprise to anybody sitting here, but it, it, it has to be at least somewhat frustrating to people in, in the county departments that spend, you start in October, mm -hmm. they go through your budget process and through the year, and for example, and I may be off slightly, somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 positions were asked for and we got we're funding 23 mm -hmm. 
That's a pretty big hit for, I mean, that's a lot of meetings where the idea of hiring somebody doesn't even get out the door of the first meeting. And we go through, and you guys painstakingly put this together, um, and we're contemplating going back to the taxpayer for additional revenue for the, the, the needs that are so large. And uh, the and the and this board has done a tremendous job supporting both Kannapolis and Cabarrus County Schools and Rowan and Cabarrus in, at the college level. Didn't quite sound that way when they were here the other night to me, but I think we've done a pretty good pretty good job. And so the level of frustration on our side when we have now sitting here and looking at these numbers, and then the first thing out of the gate, the revenue, the extra revenue that we're trying to capture to to put us in a better position two years from now, three years from now, is absolutely hammered, not their fault, but it, by the school system. And it's, 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 I wish I had some ingenious idea to figure out a better way to fund it, a better way to get them situated, a better way to have our projects taken a little, uh, have a little more priority because, uh, I mean, day in and day out, when you're looking at things that keep getting deferred, it's, you know, and I'm not here every day, I'm not sitting in your offices, I'm not dealing with that every day. That's got to be monumentally frustrating for, for all of you sitting here that do an incredible job on a daily basis for the citizens of this county. So, Mr. Chairman, again, that's just a general comment. That's not a knock on the school system. I know they their board sits and does the same thing we do and look look they, they have students they have to take care of and projects that they need to do and the buildings that we build have to be maintained. But it's uh, it's just tough to look that when it's hard to go back to the taxpayer the, a, a year after doing it we and then look at the revenue that it's going to generate knowing it's walking out the door as fast as it's coming in um, so that's again I'm, I'm not criticizing anybody I'm just making a general comment well I, th I, th I think those are valuable comments and um, I, I share some of those sentiments um, after our discussions um, on Tuesday night uh, particularly in regards to um, teacher supplements uh, which we have included already in our budget, a 0.25% increase, which we began doing that in 2013 or 20. In year four of the 15. Okay. Right, and so so we so we set a goal and said we would do this each year to reach the goal, and we have followed through with that and done that each year. Uh, of course, as, w as we've done that, our competitors have increased theirs as well, and I think that's what the school system is saying. Um, uh, we, we still haven't gotten ahead. And, and so we had two public speakers at our meeting on Monday night. Um, um, one of those in particular, I think, referred to Union County, Onslow County, and New Hanover County, making comparisons between what we were doing and what they were doing. Uh, then I think the superintendent, <clears throat> when he was here on Tuesday night, cited those same three counties as examples. So that, in my mind, I wanted to have some level of education as to exactly what they were doing. You know, when, when you try to compare with them, I'm saying, okay, maybe we're not doing as well as they are, or may, you know, how, 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 do we, how do we make those comparisons? And so, so I requested some information. The one thing, I, I have the chart um, that they referred to that shows all the counties in North Carolina. And then, um, so just as an example, and, and, and Pam Dubois uh, gathered this information and, and helped me to try to understand it, so please correct me if I say it wrong, but Union County, for example, uh, at, at, which was one of the ones that were compared to, and they were comparing our supplement to their supplement, um, 
as I understand it, Union County sets a school tax rate. As far as their total property tax rate, they say that 44.5%, uh, which is proposed for fiscal year 2020, goes to schools. And so when that's, they allocate that amount of money to the schools and then they say you do with it what you will. If you want to spend it on supplements, you can do that. If you want to spend it on local positions, you can do that. Um, and, and so they have the opportunity to, to, to establish those rates. Um, when I then look at Cabarrus County uh, and what, <clears throat> what we are funding, um, and, and, and these positions are not broken down to, to the extent that I know what they are, and, and I'm am in, in no way questioning um, the validity of any of those positions, but we've got, we've got 64 teachers that we're funding with benefits local, from local funds. That, that represents $4.6 million. Uh, we're funding 11 administrators with benefits. I don't, I don't know what those positions are either, but that's $1.6 million. Um, six assistant principals, that's another 500, another half a million dollars. Um, so, so when you break all these down and say, okay, well, are these other counties funding the same level of local positions that we are? And it's really hard to, to break it down. Here's what the administrators are. Okay, so now, now, now I know what, what those positions are. <clears throat> but I, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is um, if according, according to this sheet, we have 2,267 teachers that we're paying supplements to. Supplement to, yes. I think. I think that's as of FY19 or 18. 18. 18. Yeah, so this is fiscal year 18. So it's a, the, old. It's a year <laughs> lag there. But at that time, so that supplement came up to $4,177 per position. Um, if we were to eliminate less some of these local, locally paid positions and use that money take all that money and put it towards supplements. Um, and, and I did some, some figures. Um, if we eliminated all those that I just mentioned, put them towards supplement, then the, the supplement would be uh, $6,950 per teacher using that 22,267 number. You know, obviously um, there are some of those positions that are that are valuable that, that they would not want to eliminate. So which brings the question to me is according to the law in North Carolina, um, the state of North Carolina is supposed, is supposed to fund the operations of the schools and the teacher salaries. Counties are supposed to provide the facilities and maintain them and so forth. Well, and, and I, I say this primarily for benefit of the public, for them to understand that we are doing way far more um, than, than what the state requires. And, and if I'm not mistaken, and got too many pieces of paper and too many notes here, but I, th I think our total is, isn't it around $70 million a year? And the, current expense. When you add mm -hmm. all the, the different categories in, in that ballpark. That's, that's current expense. That's current, current expense. That's that's got nothing right. to do with buildings, um, uh, any of those things. Those are, <clears throat> that's what we're doing over and above what, what, the, what the, the law requires mm -hmm. us to do. So, you know, when you try to, you know, and I'm, I'm sympathetic with, with the, with the <laughs> supplement situation. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, they are in a competitive, competitive situation. Uh, I think one of the people mentioned Mecklenburg County uh, to us the, the other night, one of our public speakers. Uh, I think that we all realize we will never, ever 
compete with Mecklenburg County. Um, and, and, you know, I don't want to make disparaging remarks about our friends um, uh, close to us, but they have to beat everybody else's supplement to get anybody to work uh, in their school system for, for various reasons. I mean, obviously they do, or I think then they've requested a substantial increase again this year. Uh, so for, we, we will never be able to compete with them, but the, the other thing, and, and I don't understand how these supplements are applied, uh, and, and so these are questions and, you know, I wish the school system folks were here, and we certainly can have those conversations with them. But when, when you take the supplements to teachers, um, that you come up with that $4,177 figure, and here again, this is fiscal year 18, and then another row down, you've got supplements for principals and assistant principals with benefits, there's 107 of them. So when you divide the total, one point, it's approximately $1.7 million divided by 107, then the supplements for those come up to $15,810 a piece, which, which is um, over triple the, the supplement for the teachers. And so at one point in time, we talked about flat rate supplements, then then it, <clears throat> so you get this dollar amount of supplement. Then I think it changed to percentage rate supplements. So if, if we're trying to do things to benefit, to attract the younger first year teachers or, or teachers that are younger in their career where they're at a lower pay level, then that means their supplement is substantially less, so I'm not sure that accomplishes that goal. Does that mean that the veteran teachers don't deserve it? I'm not saying that at all because they, they do. I, I just don't understand how it works, and I haven't been able to get that answer. Uh, do you do it? You, do y'all share any of those questions, um, or maybe you understand it better than I do? No, I don't. I, I have those. I have some of those same questions as well, and just wonder if it would be possible for us to supply those questions to you guys and you get I know you have regular meetings and see if you can get some of those answers uh, between now and our work session I think that's that's a, that's an excellent idea and yeah and and my my intention in looking at these other systems and these other figures is not to justify paying less um, I would be in favor of, of attempting to, to do a little bit more. If, if we can, I just want to know where it's going to. And, um, in, and the, I, I talked about Union County Schools, and then, then I also have a sheet for, for New Hanover County Schools. And if the, all of these are equally confusing to me, so New Hanover has uh, implemented a pre-K program. So when you're looking at the positions, they have decided to actually, as a county fund part of preschool, mm -hmm. pre-K, excuse me. So she, the lady that I worked with from New Hanover was unable to tell me how many of those local positions were for the pre-K program and how of them for a regular school. So I was not able to distinguish between that. Right that part of that information but i wanted to point out on the supplement schedule when kelly and i worked on the supplement schedule the very first number is supposed to be the total teacher's salary so if there are 2267 teachers that number that starts that spreadsheet off is supposed to be the accumulation of every teacher's salary times eight percent that is how that spreadsheet works Mm -hmm. So one would think that that means that every teacher is getting an 8% supplement based on how that spreadsheet is calculated. When I had the conversation with New Hanover last fiscal year, and I know that we got information about the average supplement, and average can be swayed by how much teachers are making, so they could have more tenure teachers than we have, or vice versa. But the was explained to me that the New Hanover supplement was an 8% supplement last year, and now it is a flat rate supplement. 
So they converted and went the opposite direction from a percentage of pay to a flat rate supplement where we went the opposite direction. Uh, I was not able to get information to contact Union County and to get with Onslow County, but I was able to get with the short part of the afternoon that I had to get a little bit of information than I did get. So I did want you to understand that that formula for the supplement spreadsheet is supposed to be the total teacher salary number mm -hmm. times the percentage of 8% with all the benefits that go on to it. And that's what we were doing last year. And then this year was getting it to 8.25%. Okay. And then um, based on what you just said and, and using that figure, taking $9,470,348, which should be that total salary, um, and, okay, wait a minute. I, you lost, I, I'm, now, now I'm confused. The <laughs> I think I know what you're trying to do. Yeah. So if you were trying to. I would say this number right here divided by this number right here gives this result. Yes. That, that would be a mathematical calculation to get. Yeah. But that can be deceptive because of the rate, you know, this teacher makes right. this much, this teacher makes this much, this teacher makes this much. So to me, that, that is would, kind of a deceptive. Yeah. Because some people do flat rate supplements, some people do percentage supplements, and I think you have to put it all together the same way in order for it to be comparative. Yeah, and, and I'm not, I don't know how to do that. And that's <laughs> the same problem that you're having with this here. Right. Is and that so you don't know how they come up with that. Is that a flat rate supplement? Is that a percentage of salary or whatever? And I think that information is necessary for, for, for you to understand what the real comparison is. And, <clears throat> and I agree, uh, to, going back to what you said, Chairman Morris, that I don't think any of us disagree that the supplements are warranted and deserved. Right. It's just that when you put together the amount of money that we're spending that, that is not mandated, but we're doing it for other reasons, right. and then you're building the schools. I think they mentioned that we build eight schools in four years. The money, it, there's just, it's hard to find the money to do it. And so then when, when they come in and throw these counties out as comparison or where they stand to where we are, then you do wonder if it's apples to apples and oranges to oranges because you can turn the numbers any way you want, any time you want. We can, you can, anybody can. So are we all on the same page with the numbers? So I think to that point, and I, it's not going to matter. We either have the money or we don't have the money, so I'm not sure how much time should be spent on trying to figure out if we're looking at Onslow and Union and Cabarrus in the same way. But if there was some way to do that without it taking a lot of time as a true comparison, looking at the things that you're looking at along with the school system to see how we really truly compare on an equal basis. Yeah, because like I said, when I talked to New Hanover, when it was proposed that New Hanover was doing better than we are, they were doing the exact same thing we were doing last year. They were at 8% and we were at 8%. So I think you need to have either a flat rate or a percentage, not an average supplement. It needs to be we're X percent of salary or we're doing a flat scale and it looks like this. Because like I said, you could have, I don't know, 1,500 teachers and they've all been with you 20 plus years and they're gonna have higher salaries. So you may get a bigger salary number divided by whatever and come up with a different, you know, it just depends on what the actual thing is. So you need to know the methodology of how they come up with a supplement, not the average. How did they calculate it? And that would be a simple thing to call, you know, to pick up the phone and say, what is your, how does your supplement work? And I think just to have that accurate information would be good, would be good although it's not gonna cause us to have more money. <laughs> no, but so. we, that would be an easy, that would be an easier conversation than the conversations I've had today. And we shared a bunch of information back and forth between New Hanner and I, uh, and I uh, the lady that I spoke with in the budget office had been there about a year so I was telling her what we did. So I started sharing spreadsheets with her and she was sharing spreadsheets with me. So we were getting some information back and forth. And it's, an, it's a great connection to have for the future to have someone to talk to. But if 
calling those five different counties would not be that difficult to ask how those supplements were calculated. Is it a flat rate or is it a percentage? And I, I know more now since I made those phone calls today that that's the easier question to ask. Yeah. Well, and I think we need some accurate gauge. I mean, how are we doing? Uh, uh, when and, and and what kind of information are we getting? And and that was very helpful. When when I do the simple math, which is all I know how to do, which is take the total amount we're spending, the total number of people we're giving it to it, and divide it to come up with the average, and I get 4177, <clears throat> and then I go look at this chart, which is the one that was referenced the other night, um, and I look at New Hanover County, they show that their average supplement is $3,976, which is less than, than ours. I'm, I'm not saying that's c correct or not, but we just need to have some way. And so, you know, and fortunately, I think, I think everyone on this board uh, wants to do the right thing and do the best, the best that we can. But if we wanted, you know, and of course they say, this is where you rank in the state and you're below the state average. I believe that was another comment that was made. Well, <clears throat> then, that, then I say, okay, well, how do we rank on these local positions? Exactly, and or or yeah, just take the seventy-six million, the total that we're. How does that compare? And so, if we were the type of people that just really wanted to look good on this chart, all we'd have to do is just switch it from this category to this category, and and we could become um, top five in the state. But that's not the way we operate. We're trying to <clears throat> meet the needs where, where they need to be met. So I, th I think we can do a little bit more work on that and maybe come up with some more, uh, some clearer answers But between now and our work session and, and talk about that a little bit more and, and then talk about some, some options um, that, that are available, might be available to us. And in doing so, I would just ask if you can meet if we if you can come with whatever you say that the school people agree and you agree not because they come in and say say what they have to say but then we don't really have that information that y'all say yep we agree or that you know, these like these conversations we're having sure. so if you guys could do that between now and then and make sure that everybody agrees at least on how it's presented comparatively yes. absolutely rather than hearing one thing and seeing something different on this chart and that chart and and if as much time as as all of us sitting around the table spend trying to evaluate and figure out these things with all the material that we have to use i know it must be terribly confusing to somebody that's not sitting here with us watching on television um, they don't have these resources to look at so if we could you know, the more understandable we could make it for the public, I think the better it would be. And, and for the teachers as well. Because I'm not sure if they've got a good handle on it or not. But that, I think, will be very, very helpful. And I'm sure that there are some other areas of the budget that we need to talk about. And I think one of those may be the recycling issue that we talked about a little bit at our last meeting. Mr. Chairman, before we move on, can I comment yes, on sir. the school part there? <clears throat> you know, we talked about this last year when it come around budget time, and the same story that you well explained came up, you know, state responsibility, county responsibility, and operational cost obviously being state responsibility. What I would like to see us do and I don't know who can do this, but that would be to get us a report that breaks down that operational cost to what is mandated that we have to pay of that operational cost. Obviously, utilities is something that's part of the operational cost. We got to pay that. We got to obviously pay the, the, the custodians and supplies and all those type things. But what, where is in a country boy's way of putting it, where's the fat in the operational cost? Things that we're paying that we're really not mandated to pay. 
Is that something that we can get done? We could look at the law, but there's this one sentence. And I'm not going to get it right, but it says we're responsible for this, 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 and this, and then anything else that's necessary for a, a proper public education. So they have this generic statement that throws it all back on the local government. I think that's what it is. But we can get to the basics of it, of the rules, because I, I still have a lot of the files and stuff out there where we can go back when the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners gave the whole history of the right. educational process. I've right. still got that PowerPoint presentation where we can go back and find those rules and how they come about. Come about. So we can work with, because I, I know Kristen's out tomorrow, we can work with Lauren tomorrow and, tomorrow and get that information together so she'll be able to work through that for you out tomorrow. <coughs> okay, well, I'll well, be here tomorrow. Yeah, well, I think that's and Susan will be here tomorrow, so we'll do some work on that a little bit and get started on that. But we've got some of that information to pull sure. that together. Well, it'll be very helpful for a number of reasons because, you know, I've, I've often said, you know, sure, we can, we can match, maybe even beat some of the comp uh, competitive counties if we didn't have all of these things here that we're doing that we don't really have to do. Right. And I, I know I made a mention one time, you know, I don't know how many other school uh, or however many counties that has the amount of growth which brings the school construction. And as Commissioner Honeycutt mentioned, you know, and they mentioned it here the other night, eight schools in four years, and we got two under construction now, and we're making plans for two more. What other counties in North Carolina is doing that? And so if we didn't have all of this school debt and we didn't have all of this operational cost, it could turn into millions and millions of dollars that could be used to raise teacher supplements to be more competitive, equally or more competitive. So the things that we've talked about in the last 15, 20 minutes is very relevant. And, there, you know, it can't be keeping up with the Joneses, guys. It can't be, that's just another country boy way of putting it, it can't be keeping up with the Joneses. We got to take care of what we got with the resources we have without continually bombarding the public for more and more and more. And uh, I think we're going to have to sort of look at the school funding to the point where that uh, there might be some changes so that we can meet the needs better. And that's just my two cents worth, guys, you know. I've been doing this for four and a half years now, and it seemed like it's the same thing every year. So we need to make some really strong, concrete decisions to help in some areas that um, things that we shouldn't be doing, we shouldn't, instead of doing it because it's going to do this better or whatever. But anyway. Well, I, th I think that <clears throat> that when when we are compared to to other counties. Um, which, which is what I've heard, then it makes me want to understand, okay, well, that's, that's fair, but how, how, are, how are we doing? And so in, in some of the conversations, um, you know, I was curious, so how does our ratio of locally paid positions compare to the ratio of locally paid positions other school systems have? And I guess you'd have to break that down on a per capita or per student basis, some fair way of, of accurate, accurately coming up with that. And, and it takes a little time to do that. I think we can though. <clears throat> and so how, how do we stack up? And, and so in some of those conversations where I've asked those kind of questions, um, it has been brought to my attention that, for example, every year or every year that I've been on the board, um, we routinely if the state increases teacher pays or benefits for for any for, for teachers positions we have pretty much automatically matched those increases on all the local positions uh, that we fund locally to keep every, which sounds like a fair thing to do to me well when <clears throat> when we have mentioned that to other counties um, uh, and to other school systems, uh, they say we don't do that, or, or or we've never heard of such a thing. You know those kind of things. So there there are a lot of nuances there. 
I think a lot of things that we've tried to do that are, are appropriate and right um, that, that other, other counties don't do. So if, if they don't do those things and, and, and use that money on stuff, supplements instead, well then obviously they're gonna, they're gonna look better on this chart. And so the question is, do we wanna look good, look good on the chart or do we wanna do the best we can do for our students and for our teachers? Yeah, so that's, those are easy questions, hard answers, I think. Uh, so enough, if, is that enough on that topic to move to the next one? Well, we'll turn it over to the county manager. Okay, um, one, one of the items uh, that we need to talk about is, is the recycling. As we talked earlier, there, there is a projected uh, there's a projected uh, $300,000 increase in the collection and processing of recyclable materials for the ensuing year. Well, the total projected cost is about $300,000. Um, the increase over the last year um, is not quite that much. Um, the issue for the additional money, I think there was misinformation, kind of my fault for not catching it. When we did discuss the three hundred thousand dollars, you got to realize out of the re recycling program expense, the ninety three seventy um, consists of two items: it's residential recycling expense and it's also TV and electronic expense. There's two items. The way we had it, both both numbers came up to three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and the mistake was that the residential recycling is three hundred thousand dollars in addition to sixty five thousand for electronics and TVs. With regards to the $300,000, um, I'm still negotiating with Republic Services on footing the bill. That would be the county footing the bill completely for the unincorporated residents that have their recycling sent to the material recycling facility, as well as the convenience centers. Um, I've already expressed to them that it is not fair that we foot the whole bill, um, that the residents that subscribe to this service need to pay for this because whenever there's an additional increase in rates, say for fuel increase or, or just the, the COI or landfill tip fees go up, those rates for the residents go up. So I've kind of expressed it needs to be similar to that. We shouldn't be footing this whole bill. The issue they have right now is if they apply this whole charge right off the bat, it's gonna double what they pay for recycling. I think their big fear is losing subscribers that will just stop subscribing to Republic and maybe just bring it up to our facility. Um, one thing I did suggest is that we cover the first quarter so it gives them a little bit of time to get the information out there and maybe do a gradual increase over the course of the year and we subsidize it. So if that's the case, we won't need this whole chunk of money right here. And that's what I'm hoping we're gonna do. We're still in negotiations. They seem to like that plan. We just haven't been able to nail the details of it. Okay, so when will those conversations take place? We've got to have a, we're, we've got to have an answer. We're trying to get something here within the next week or so. Okay. I'm also pushing Mecklenburg County to give us a final number in terms of accepting the material to us as well. Um, I've got a verbal of $95 a ton. Um, I met with them yesterday. I'm supposed to see something in writing next week. They keep saying that that 95 will hold. That's that's a decent number. Um, so I'm hoping to get this thing finalized as quickly as possible. Okay. So I guess for the board's purposes, we're trying to figure out: is it 300,000? Do does the county supplement that? In entirety for the first year do, do they do 25 percent 50 percent 75 percent I are, mean that's that's what we're working I already like I said I already told them I don't think it's right that we supplement the hundred percent of it and I think they agree with it so like I said now it's it's coming up with this plan that they gradually increase the rate over there so like I said the first quarter um, what I suggested is we covered a hundred percent and then then scale it down than having say the residents pay an extra dollar a month which would reduce our contribution greatly and then that third quarter 
another dollar, which basically almost takes us out of it completely. So currently, who pays for this service? The service current, we are actually paying for this last increase that I think I presented to you that covered um, July or January 1st to the end of to June 30th here, which we're coming up to that increase. We've been paying for that right now. I'm talking about if, if when they pick up my recycling at the yeah. house, who is paying for that service? When it's coming to you, you are paying about three dollars and eighteen cents for recycling. Okay. Um, at the time, we had a separate contract for the actual material because when the market was good, we were actually getting a little bit of money back, and this has kind of shifted dramatically in the opposite direction. Um, so you're you are just paying for the actual collection and transportation. Like with the trash, you are actually paying for collection, transportation, and disposal. And so what we need to start doing with the recycling portion is if you want that service, you need to pay for the collection, the transportation, and instead of disposal, we'll call it the sorting capability. So the increase of $300,000 is what? Is it the collection, the transportation, it's, or just sorting? It is just the sorting okay. at that facility. Okay. And it goes back, I mean, we had a Government 101 presentation yesterday. Um, and in order to provide convenience for residents to recycle, we allow everybody to put everything into one bucket, so to speak. Okay, so when, when they're sending this material to different marketers, the people don't want plastic, paper, glass, cardboard all mixed together. They either want plastic, they want glass, they want paper, they want cardboard. It's got to get sorted somewhere, okay? Um, and, and the cost of doing this is, is pretty high. I mean, it is up in, it's 80, 85 bucks a ton right now. Um, so that's where Mecklenburg is offering a $95 a ton charge. Um, they need that extra little bit of money to cover for any maintenance costs, new equipment. We need them to operate because there's not another material recycling facility in this region. The cl next closest one is probably Conover. Um, so we do need to work with them if we want to continue to do this. And I think we do want to recycle because we keep talking about the Speedway landfill and how that's filling up. And we did take a group of residents up there yesterday to see that. and. I think if you all take a visit over there and see what that place looks like and the amount of trash that comes in there on a constant basis, I think we all need to look into recycling as much as possible. And I think even further, we all need to look at reducing the amount of waste we generate. And like I said, I think if you go up there and see that and spend just an hour up there, you would feel really, really bad about what we put in the garbage can every day. Um, and I know we are being very restrictive and we're starting to tell a lot of folks about what well, you can't put in a recycling cart um, but recycling is still very very important um, there's people that need it but we also need to start to recycle right to help these folks out and um, hopefully I mean we're hitting at what I'm hoping is a rock bottom in a recycling market the good news that I've seen already and yesterday I heard that the majority of the stuff that gets separated and bailed down in Charlotte stays fairly local. So, I mean, it's staying on the east coast of North Carolina, or it may, it may stay in this region. There's only the plastic that gets shipped overseas. So we're, we're pretty well poised, and I know we've been talking about China as the big reason why recycling market prices have depressed, and that's, that's probably true. Um, it's that and the amount of contamination that folks are actually putting in the recycling carts. Um, a lot of it thinking that if you put something in that cart, it's going to get recycled. Um, so what we call wishful recyclers. And so that's what we're trying to do is start to educate folks more in terms of recycling right um, and, and get the recycling economy back up to where it needs to be. We're hoping it's short term that some of this cost will go away and hopefully the cost back to the residents, um, you know, gets erased here but I'm not sure exactly when at this point. Okay, so I'm just making sure, every, so we all understand, currently the customer pays for the pickup and the transportation. 
Correct. So the processing and separation, who pays for that now and how much per ton is it right now? Right now it is about, as we speak, it's about $77 a ton for yeah. processing and separation. And they're proposing to go to July 95. 1st, we're talking $95 a ton. And the county pays the 77 Currently we've now. been paying the whole thing from January 1st to June 30th because of, and I think we presented it to y'all back in the fall, um, that Sunoco Recycling, who you, we used to have the contract with, they got out of the recycling or the residential recycling business and a lot of it was because of the amount of contamination and them not being able to turn around and make money off of it. So we were really restricted in terms of where we had to go with. And so Republic Services has been managing the Mecklenburg County Recycling Facility. And those are the folks that we're having a current agreement with. Going forward, Mecklenburg County said that any material, and they do want our stuff and they do want to work with us, but they said anything going through them, any material going into that facility now, the deal has to be with them instead of who is operating the facility. So the I hope that makes sense. You, yeah, I think it does. So the benefit of the county paying the 77 now and even the 95 is is offsetting the cost what the residents have to pay for that service. They don't currently pay for it now. That is correct. Okay. Like I said, roughly what is when the, you when you break the subscription rate down for those residents, it's roughly $17 a month for trash disposal and roughly three dollars and say 25 cents for recycling and so back in the good old days we realized income from the process and or as I, little not, as little as about a year and a half ago maybe two years ago we were actually receiving a little bit of revenue there was right. like a cost sharing so give you a quick example say the processing cost was $70 a ton, the market prices were $100 a ton. We would, so that $30 profit that they were getting, they were splitting that with us. So we'd get half of that money. So we were, we were probably receiving about $30,000 a year for recycling. So we were receiving $30,000 a year for recycling. Now we're spending, Potentially. have we spent more, have, have we used up all that we, Let's say if we took all the money we received and mm -hmm. put it in the pot, have, have oh, we? Oh, we've gone way past it. Yes. We've gone yeah, way it's, past it's it. Yeah, it's changed dramatically. And just so you know, it doesn't make you feel good, but this is an issue the whole country's going through. And these prices are consistent everywhere. Um, I mean, you are having some communities that are discontinuing recycling. But you, to, you to make it even more complicated, and <clears throat> I mean, for this very reason that we're filling landfills with everything, um, we have state laws that say some of those things aren't supposed to go into landfills. So if you don't have recycling, you have material going into your landfill that state law says shouldn't be going in there. So there, it gets very complicated and it, there's a lot of policies and issues involved with it that all kind of merge, but what we're looking at is cost. Yeah, so what I'm trying to get at is is there a benefit to the county to continue to se separate, process and separate enough of a benefit for the county that we should share in that cost, take on all of that cost, or pass it on to the, to the user? My, my opinion is the start that we start sharing the cost and gradually wean it off because it is you're, you're gonna get, we're trying to make sure that we get people to continue to recycle if, and this is what Republic's afraid of too, that if you double that rate from say 325 to 650, that you're gonna get people no longer subscribing and the, maybe they no longer recycle, maybe they just put everything in the trash, take it up to our convenience center on Irish Potato Road. Um, we still need to divert as much as possible but I think the other thing that folks have to realize that recycling is not free. There's processing cost that goes into it. Right. Um, it's just not giving it to somebody and somebody's making a lot of money off of that. So I think by what Kevin's proposed, we, we've got a worst case in our budget where we're supplementing that. We start to 
through this agreement, we would start to increase that fee to the user, and we're going to have to monitor how many people start to drop their service. And then that, I think that will give you as a board an idea, is that increased rate causing too many people to drop off and we're not getting recycling? And then that comes back to a, your local policy, too. Yeah, so I'm trying to figure mm -hmm. out, is yes, $300,000 the best number? Is it 200000 if you say we're going to, you would prefer to phase? And, and I just want to make sure the board understands what's the what's the benefit of us picking this up? Is it to is it to subsidize the customer? But there's there's other benefits to it as well, right? Mm -hmm. And what is that worth? That's what I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out. So, well, you talk about. I guess you can say, what does this contribute going to the Speedway landfill? How fast does that fill up? Um, and then once that fills up, and as we go towards the end of that life over there. These, these numbers we're talking about are going to be small potatoes, to be honest. Right. And, ju and just to let you know, Kannapolis and Concord, they're wrestling with this, too, because they, are, they basically are having the same agreement we are. So their costs are comparable, if not more. Um, so the, they're encountering this right now, and they're in the same boat as we are. They, they don't have a piece of paper in front of them in terms of, in terms of agreement and going that, forward. That brings up another concern. With, with the municipalities, if they choose to subsidize that out of their general fund, they're, they're doing that for every citizen in the city. If we choose to subsidize it out of our general fund, we're only doing it for a small portion of our citizens yes. in the unincorporated area, which is not exactly fair yeah to those that live in the incorporated areas. But, the, and the thing I was gonna ask you, and I, 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 I found an article in the paper after we, mm -hmm. you talked with us the other day. I clipped it out and made copies of it. I was gonna hand it out, and of course I left it laying on the kitchen table, but uh, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, and it had a very optimistic outlook for recycling materials, the, the value returning. I'm a, yeah, I, that may be the article you referred to. Yeah, and there, there. I mean, it's in the long, long run. This is actually what's going on, especially with China rejecting a lot of our stuff. It's gonna, it's gonna build up the recycling industry domestically, and it's and and the southeast. We're more, we're better poised than most areas of the country because we do have a lot of recycling business already in place. We do have recycled paper mills down in Rockingham. Uh, Ashboro's got plastic recycling facilities. There's some plastic recycling facilities in Reedville, and then just in the southeast in general. It's just this short term because a lot of material was on its way to the west coast to be sent to China. China said, nope, we don't want it anymore. A lot of stuff sitting there, there's a glut in the market. So when there's a glut in the market, obviously the price goes gets really depressed. Um, it's how fast does that material start to get dispersed, either staying here or going overseas to other places. And once that happens, then you'll start to see the prices adjust a little bit. Um, but the, the reality is that the cost of recycling is here to stay. And the other thing is it's a little skewed here, especially where we live, because the cost of disposal stuff in landfills here is a heck of a lot cheaper than it is in most places in the country. Um, so yeah, it looks like recycling costs more than actually putting stuff in a landfill. It's not that way in say in the Northeast. It is here, so it's, it's a little, little screwed up right now. So it, it is tough when I go out and give presentations about the virtues of recycling and why we need to do it, because from an economic standpoint, it does not make sense. It, it will make sense here probably in about 10 years though. And we, and I, the, the big fear is disrupting recycling and then having to bring it back when we absolutely have to do it because the Speedway landfill is full. All of a sudden now we're having to ship our trash 50 miles down the road and what we're paying now is gonna be a bargain compared to that. So that's, that's the biggest fear is you hate to disrupt any type of momentum with recycling. So what we have done is we have, we have budgeted what Kevin thinks is the worst case scenario based on current or expected tonnage over the next year. So are you okay with that we do it that way and then we see how the market goes. The market could go back the other way and get better 
or it, or if it doesn't, we can also see how Concord and Kannapolis are going to handle those fees as well in, in, in other communities as well. So, so we may not spend the three, whole 300. That's worst case scenario, hopefully. Our intention yeah, is not to spend it. Yeah, so I just wanted to make sure you guys understood where Kevin's coming from, from the, his expertise, but then from the budget standpoint, there is a $300,000 number in there. We don't intend to spend all of it. And depending on how, how things go with the industry or, or the other jurisdictions, do we want to start only subsidizing 25% or 50% of that? And if it does, then that $300,000 $300, is gonna get less. So we'll come to you. We'll keep it monitored and come to you. Keep you keep them posted pretty good throughout the year to say what's the industry doing, what are our neighbors doing, and then then you guys can make decisions. Yeah, like I, I think we have to look at how many how many years have it, have you and others been working on recycling education in Cabarrus County, talking to school groups and civic clubs and church we, groups and we've been as long as I've been here, we've been doing it. Um, it's just getting a heck of a lot more publicity in the last year because of all the news articles and um, a lot of it's been negative towards recycling with a lot of bad things, but at the same time, it's still publicity. We're, I've had more people call me up, ask me to go talk to different groups than ever before. Um, when we go out with the school children, um, they, they know it, they're being, they're being taught right. The big thing right now is is we're probably regrouping a little bit and, and, and working with folks in terms of recycling right. Smart Cause, recycling. Yeah, because yeah. it's, it's, right now it's extremely complicated because of the type of packaging that manufacturers are, are putting their product in. There's a lot of stuff, for example, there's mixed plastics that might be a mix of three different chemicals. And these recyclers, they don't want that because they can't recycle the darn stuff. They try to grind it up, it's a mix of everything. So you're, you're seeing that, so it's almost like we gotta back up and say, hey, if we're gonna recycle, we gotta do it right. Um, making sure the products, and like, I've, like we told the group yesterday, you know, and a lot of them came away saying, you know, I'm a little depressed because I gotta put more stuff in the garbage. And the, the, real, the trick is, is when you go looking for a product, Pay attention to what's that what it's packaged in. Start to look, and that's part of our job too, is to educate folks to start looking for that. So um, I think we're hitting it harder. I know we've got the Cartology app and software that's available on that you can get on your smartphone, um, and it's available on the county webpage. It's got a drop-down box that basically has a bunch of different products in terms of what you can do with it. And that's one way we're trying to reach out to folks. Um, it's it's an inexpensive way to reach out to people, um, and it and we've had it out for almost a year now, um, and we're we're starting to see good results out of that. I've heard more discussion about cartology in the last two months <laughs> than um, for whatever reason. I've heard a lot of people talk about it. I'm starting to see more and more people. I know the group that we had yesterday, a big majority of them actually do use it. Um, it's also a good way, an easy way for us to communicate with a big group of people quick. I can send out an alert or a message to everybody who subscribes or has a Cartology app and they'll get an alert on their phone right away. So, I mean, it's, it's really, really a good, efficient way to get the word out to folks. Any other questions on recycling? That might be the most we've ever talked about recycling in one stretch of time since I've been, well, yeah. maybe alive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've talked more about recycling in the last couple of months than I think I ever thought I would. And when you take into account yesterday, I don't think I've stopped talking about recycling for about 36 hours. It's a moving target. Uh, it's it's very right now like like when we present it's it's very very frustrating because you're like I said you're trying to promote recycling but at the same time you're saying you don't do this and this costs more but it, it's still important it's still we need to conserve natural resources too because we keep focusing on the, the these dollars here 
we start sucking up a lot of these natural resources, all these products are going to start going up. Yeah, and Kevin mentioned it a little bit as we were, we do not want that landfill at the speedway to fill up any quicker than possible. It has to. And, yep. and as we're talking about uh, recycling now, we need to start having conversations on where, what is the next location that our solid waste is going. And so probably need to have those sooner than later. So we'll, we'll be stay tuned on that sometime next year. We'll start talking more about that, what, what looks, when it fills up, what is next. And I know Kevin's already looking at other regional facilities around and seeing what those opportunities are. So short of having a landfill in the county, which you know are very hard to cite and very uh, contentious about uh, going through that process, those regional facilities are the ones that we're going to need to look at. And you know other jurisdictions are going to be doing the same and they're going to have capacities just like these landfills do. So we've, we've got to start making decisions. Right, in the next right years. now at this present time, if that place fills up, we will be building transfer stations in the county, which is basically a big dumping pad. So you've got your garbage collection trucks will go in, collect from door to door from the residents. They'll take it to this transfer station because those trucks are inefficient to haul it, say, 20, 30, 40 miles. You put it in on a transfer station pad, you put that in a tractor trailer, and then you ship it out. That's right now what it looks like it'll happen. Uh, my discussions with Mecklenburg, that's what they're looking at right now as well. They would probably build four or five, six transfer stations throughout the county, send everything there. From there, it goes to a different landfill. Which landfill that is right now, we don't know. But that's kind of the thought process unless something dramatically changes in technology. And, and those transfer stations are going to be very close as hard to site uh, in, in as a landfill will be because as you know now you can see the debris you can tell the paths of some of the of the of the trucks going down there because of stuff blowing off and it's not just garbage solid waste it's some of our other construction materials too that are flying everywhere so so just stay tuned for that thanks Kevin good job um, I'm going down the list here fire you heard the fire districts are you guys comfortable, uncomfortable with the fire districts? Are you okay with uh, us including those in the budget? Mm -hmm. I'm okay. Good, good, good. Okay. Um, the Health Alliance had a rather large increase for their clinics. And they told you why they needed to do it and how important they are. So uh, we'll, we'll need some direction on that. Do we include those? Do we move forward with their request? I think the position requests were, or the the nurses, from our perspective, I would I would recommend the nurses uh, th that you do to do that. But then the clinics are the other important thing. And the clinic amount is currently included in the uh, budget. It is in there. It's a two hundred thousand, and it, it's in there. Yes, sir. Um, serving on the board of health, I'm in favor of of that. And, do we have consensus? Fur to your judgment, sitting on that board, you'd know the ins and outs a little more. And well, I, I mean, you know, we, we heard what Dr. Suda said the other night and talked about the, the maternal care and uh, or pregnancies, that sort of thing. And when you look at the long-term cost, uh, short-term investment in that can save us a lot of money down the road, uh, I, I believe. A low max far. I think we all earlier were okay. I've said this to uh, Diane, I know, and I think she's already gone. Uh, I would have been very skeptical about continuing that at that amount mm -hmm. had we not found a more suitable source to fund it. And since we've done that with the present use dollars, uh, I have no issue with it, okay. but um, had it not been for the present use, I probably wouldn't have supported it any more than what we have been. Right. I just wanted you to know I wasn't anti-farm because sure. I'm for the farm, I, but I, I, I just can't see us continually increasing that budget year after year after year because I think we went from like maybe 
30,000 or 25,000 to 40,000 and that was supposed to go down but yet now we want to double that but the present use value funds as uh, Liz had described earlier and I, somebody else may have too. you know it's it's better suiting for a project like that and those dollars need to be spent on something that's going to preserve land and uh, help the, the farmers in Cabarrus County so with that being said I'm okay with the, going through the present use value deferred tax Mike did you want to do just that item or all the items that were on page 12 no, that'd be great too yeah so you yeah. want Miss Farrington to go ahead and prepare that for the agenda for June I think third okay the, the work, work session, session yeah 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 we can go ahead and discuss those at the work session with the final approval along with the budget so it won't yeah. hurt anything to do it in June because it's a multi-year fund that doesn't mean I have to I won't pay it the, the um, eighty thousand until July or until they give me the, an invoice, but it won't hurt a thing to move it between funds before the June thirtieth deadline. Okay. okay, and then the, the final on my list is the the additional two cent. Are we comfortable? I mean, it's we've shown you exactly what it's going to be used for and and the need. So, uh, I, you know, obviously never um, comfortable increasing taxes uh, particularly doing it two years in a row um, I think that through the discussions that, that we've had we've clearly demonstrated the need to do it uh, we could also demonstrate the ways that we could avoid doing it if we did that um, I think that we would just be to, to just uh, an overused phrase kicking the can down the road and 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 leaving all these things for the next the next board to have to deal with which I don't think is the right thing to do uh, if you look at some of the deferred maintenance that we've got in many different areas that and we've been able to address some of those in the list that you've presented if we wait uh, for a long time uh, it's going to cost us more money uh, down the road to do that uh, when we look at what we're spending on the um, capital construction Thank for you. schools uh, yeah and, and we look back at the what if kind of things which is not always a good thing to do but you know if if the state the General Assembly had approved the uh, local sales tax flexibility that we had requ requested is, is it been four years now that we we I mean we've been doing it for a long time been asking for it and it gets put off and put off it's, it's up again this year that would be eight to nine million dollars eight million comfortably yes per year every year uh, let's say if, if it's four years that's 36 million dollars um, that that we would have realized that would have eliminated the need for any tax increase and then if you look back also at the state school bond that was proposed two years ago that was was it 32 about, 30 about 37 between the two. 37 million total dollars that that would have been debt service that we would not be mm -hmm. so that adding those things together uh, we, we may have had a could have decreased taxes um, but but those things didn't happen and and I'm not hearing any encouraging words <laughs> from Raleigh uh, that they're going to happen as a matter of fact it's quite the opposite as as we discussed in some of our school expenses earlier um, we're taking on more constantly assuming more of those responsibilities and having to fund them locally uh, where in the past they may have been funded by the state so I see I, I think it's I don't think we have a an alternative and that I certainly welcome uh, your opinions that's mine no I agree with you I, th I feel like we probably should have gone up more than two cents last year and we may not be here this year but I think for me I had hoped that maybe 
the sales tax, the referendum. That's all we're asking for is the... The people to choose. Right, for the people to be able to have a referendum on the quarter cent sales tax. And the beauty of that is a quarter cent. We'd be paying it, but all of the visitors and all the people that come here would be paying the bulk of that $8 million, um, and help us, you know, but we can't even get the permission to have the referendum. But I was hoping maybe that would happen this year, but it doesn't look like it's going to, and we can't sit here year after year and hope. We're just going to have to take the step and do it and hope that that falls into place, and then we maybe can come down on taxes at that time. But, no, I don't think anybody's comfortable wants to do it, but I think it's unrealistic to think that you can go year after year without an increase in some way because all expenses, cost of living, they're not going down. So right. somehow we have to be able to meet our needs. And um, so to your answer, Thank you. comfortable, no, but willing, right. yes. Okay. And my comments are, uh, it's like basically what you said, Mr. Chairman, you, nobody wants to ever pay more taxes than they have to. And one of the main reasons that I support this particular tax increase uh, is because if we don't do it now, it's going to, the years 2022, 23, and 24, we're going to be wishing that we did do it now because the numbers that you have prepared for us in our five-year plan, our five-year budget, I don't know whether the viewing audience knows, but we do a five-year plan. And so we try to budget monies out for the next five years. Without this increase, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it is a humongous number that we would start the year off with a deficit, something like 14 million or 15 million deficit. And then the next year it's like a $19 million deficit. And then I think one year was upwards of $30 million deficit to start the year off. And so rather than, as the chairman well stated, kicking the can down the road, we need to bite it off a little bit at a time so that we can lighten the load for future commissioners, future um, uh, staff, whoever that might be, uh, to go ahead and try to take care of some of the things now and instead of deferring it down the road, which is what's happened with our deferred maintenance with the schools. It's just sort of just got kicked down the road, and now we're trying to deal out of a, uh, get out of a $900 million plus deficit for deferred maintenance on schools. And then when you look at with what the county's trying to do with uh, the new courthouse coming up, $100 million plus for the courthouse, you're looking at uh, and potentially another high school and a middle school, and you throw all that extra debt in there, and then you add, that's where that 22, 23, and 24 gets up to upwards of $30 million deficit. And so... Uh, you know, I don't see that we really have much choice unless we want to just kick the can down the road for future commissioners, future uh, staff. <laughs> I, I don't, I've, I've got some major heartburn over doing it, and I think it's basically because we did it last year after having gone several years in a row for not doing it it's when you look at the numbers and okay, here's the revenue we're going to generate and here's what we're going to be able to check off the list to be able to do it's it's hard to say well no i don't want to do that so it's in my mind i go back and forth between philosophically speaking and thinking of asking the taxpayer to dig in their pocket again, asking a retiree who won't want a fixed income, who has no say, the bill shows up, and they gotta pay it. Um, you know, versus somebody, you know, me, I, I'm still working. I'll get up and I go to work every day, the bill comes, it's slightly larger, and you pay it, and go get coffee and do something else and don't worry about it. So, it, it, I wanted, I guess in my mind, I want to make sure that I haven't forgotten that, that there's a lot of people that it's two cents sounds like nothing, and you're in your example, $160,000, it's $30 or whatever, and that doesn't sound like much, but to some people, that, that, that's a lot. Um, but I will say that for the last probably 10 years, most of the last 10 years, I've had a front row seat um, of watching 
you all spend time and and do everything you can do to make sure that you don't ever forget that it's the taxpayer's money and being responsible with it. Pam made an impassioned sort of impromptu speech the other night um, and talked about being responsible and the numbers and trying to lay out what we're doing and do and 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 mention that in her opinion it was the right thing to do that 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 revenue was going to help us get over some hurdles that are coming at us pretty quickly and that are pretty large so that's a, that's a long drawn out way of of saying that i i, I don't take it lightly uh, i do have some major heartburn over it i do know why we're doing it i know that we've worked you all have worked very hard to show us if we don't do it here's what it looks like you know i i guess i spent most of the year or all of the year thinking boy i hope we don't face that question again and for another year or hopefully till i'm not here again but you know that's probably a little un, unrealistic so um it, with the reval coming next year, I know that that adds a little bit of uh, a little bit of a dilemma too, uh, only because it's hard to do both in the same year. Um, I guess I'll probably left our original the, the meeting that that we just kind of sat and chatted a little bit about the numbers, thinking well maybe. If the economy is growing, if we hold the line this year, we do the rebound next year, then let's see where we are and make the adjustment there. And so, I mean, that's kind of what my mindset has been. Um, and, and so, anyway, again, that's, this is a, a long, drawn-out way of saying I, I, I get what we're doing and why we're doing it. It's tough for me to just say, yeah, let's do it. So, uh, but I, I know why we're doing it. I, th I think one thing, you know, Commissioner Shu mentioned the courthouse, which kind of brought to mind to me the all the reasons that we're having to do this, and and you, you know, mentioned some of the projects that we're able to go ahead and accomplish, rather than trying to delay them, when when the the actual impact of the cost of that new courthouse hits us, we're not going to have the option to do those other things if, if we continue uh, where we are. And and the, the one thing that I think helps me reconcile it a little bit is we're not we're not building a new, you know, and I hope it, I, I still am optimistic that it'll be less than $100 million, but I continue to hear that, that figure come up. We're not doing that because we want to. And, and we're not building a new courthouse because we we want to have a prettier one or a bigger one or a bigger monument. We're doing it because we we have no choice because we have to do it because of the population increase, the increased demands on the court. Uh, you know, and we we have all toured that existing facility and seen. Uh, where storerooms have been converted into offices and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, so it's not, it's not, we're not doing it because we want to do it. We're doing it because we have to do it. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, I would, um, you know, I would really would rather not uh, have built the $70 million high school that we're currently building. Uh, but then when somebody asked me, well, where do you propose we put these students? I didn't have a good answer for it. So we had to do it. We had to do it. And, and so, you know, that's, I, I think, to try to convey that information to the public is important for all of us. You know, when, when they ask, well, why did you do this, to, to have those answers. Um, but that's enough. Okay. Chad. Thank you. Uh, um, so the only other decision uh, to be made will be the, the supplements. Do, do the, is there an opportunity to increase, keep the same, whatever? We're going to run that research for you that you've requested us to do uh, tomorrow and Monday, and we'll have it to you early, mid next week. Tuesday, not Monday. Yeah, yeah. So sometime mid next week, we should be able to get that to you so that we can talk about it again at the work session. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. I had one other question on this 
colorful sheet. Sure. The portion about the sheriff's office and the raise the age. I, I don't totally understand. I thought that raise the age was going to eliminate some of the people from the jail population because before they could be charged with certain things as 16, 17 year olds and now they can't. Am I confused about that? Let me see if I can put this in, in, in it. I may need to do more research so I can state it correctly, but they, they will no longer be sentenced as adults. Right. But they will still, they will still be charged as juveniles uh -huh. or, or have those. So those, those uh, facilities, those processes are not in place right now, so they've got to be started up. So there is okay, an additional cost. To so, so it's going to cost us more money to segregate those two populations. Is that that that's I, I maybe that's my understanding, and I will get a better better okay, better. That makes sense. You. So, so because you can't put them together. Right. Yeah, I, I understand. So there may be more facilities throughout the state that need to be right uh, enlarged or built or whatever. More staff um, to handle that population so I will get a better answer for you at right. next week as well okay what 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 else do we need to cover before we adjourn since I think we were scheduled to adjourn at 730 and it's now eight o'clock but everybody looks happy <laughs> have we have we covered yes sir your, yes. Your list? Yeah. Christine, uh, yes. uh, Christine, you good? Yep, I'm good. Okay. Any other, any other staff questions for commissioners? If not, I would entertain a motion that we adjourn. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. We stand adjourned. Thank you very much. You've all been very generous with your time and patience.